Section 1 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Lawrence in Brampton, Ontario. The Two New Houses by Carolyn Wells. Once upon a time there were two men, each of whom decided to build for himself a fine new house. One man, being of an arrogant and conceited nature, took counsel of nobody but declared that he would build his house to suit himself. For, he said, since it is my house and I am to live in it, why should I ask the advice of my neighbors as to its construction? While the house was building, the neighbors came often and looked at it and went away, whispering and wagging their heads in derision. But the man paid no heed and continued to build his house as he would. The result was that, when completed, his house was lacking in symmetry and utility, and in a hundred ways it was unsatisfactory. And for each defect there was a neighbor who said, Had you asked me, I would have warned you against that error. The other man, who was of a humble and docile mind, went to each of his neighbors in turn, and asked advice about the building of his house. His friends willingly, and at great length, gave him the benefit of their experiences and opinions, and the grateful man undertook to follow out all their directions. The result was that his house, when finished, was a hodgepodge of varying styles and contradictory effects, and exceedingly uncomfortable and inconvenient to live in. Morals? This fable teaches that in a multitude of counselors there is safety, and that too many cooks spoil the broth. End of the Two New Houses Section 2 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Yes, by John Boyle O'Reilly The words of the lips are double or single, true or false, as we say or sing, but the words of the eyes that mix and mingle are always saying the same old thing. End of Yes Recorded by Patrick Reinhardt Section 3 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Fascination by John B. Tabb Among your many playmates here, how is it that you all prefer your little friend, my dear? Because, Mama, though hard we try, not one of us can spit so high and catch it in his ear. End of Fascination Recorded by Patrick Reinhardt Section 4 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marty Chris. Barney McGee by Richard Hovey. 
Barney McGee, there's no end of good luck in you. Willow the Wisp with a flicker of puck in you. Wild as a bull pup and all of his pluck in you. Let a man tread on your coat and he'll see. Eyes like the lakes of Killarney for clarity. Nose that turns up without any vulgarity. Smile like a cherub and hair that is carroty. Whoop! You're a rarity, Barney McGee. Mellow as tarragon, prouder than Aragon. Hardly a paragon, you will agree. Here's all that's fine to you, books and old wine to you. Girls, be divine to you, Barney McGee. Lucky the day when I met you unwittingly, dining where vagabonds came and went flittingly. Here's some Barbara to drink it befittingly, that day at Silvio's Barney McGee. Many's the time we have quaffed our Chianti there, listened to Silvio quoting us Dante there. Once more to drink Nebbiolo Spamanti there, how we'd pitch Pomery into the sea. There, where the gang of us met ere Rome rang of us, they had the hang of us to a degree. How would they trust to you that was but just to you? Here's o'er their dust to you, Barney McGee. Barney McGee, when you're sober, you scintillate. But when you're in drink, you're the pride of the intellect. Divil a one of us ever came in till late. Once at the bar where you happen to be, every eye there like a spoke in you centering, you with your eloquence blarney and bantering, all vagabondias shouts at your entering. King of the tenderloin, Barney McGee! There's no satiety in your society with the variety of your esprit. Here's a long purse to you, and a great thirst to you. Fate be no worse to you, Barney McGee. Och, oh, and the girls whose poor heart you deracinate, whirl and bewilder and flutter and fascinate. Faith, it's so killing you are, you assassinate. Murder's the word for you, Barney McGee. Bold when they're sunny and smooth when they're showery. Oh, but the style of you fluent and flowery. Chesterfield's way with a touch of the bowery. How would they silence you, Barney McCree? Not can your gab allay, learned as Rabelais, you in his abbey lay once on the spree. Here's to the smile of you, oh, but the guile of you, and a long while of you, Barney McGee. Facile with phrases of length and latinity, like honorific abilitunidinity. Where is the maid could resist your vicinity, wild by the impudent grace of your plea? Then your vivacity and pertinacity carry the day with the devil's audacity. No mere veracity robs your sagacity of perspicacity, Barney McGee. When all is due to them, what will you do to them? Will you be true to them? Who shall decree? Here's a fair strife to you, health and long life to you, and a great wife to you, Barney McGee. Barney McGee, you're the pick of gentility. Nothing can faze you, you've such a facility. Nobody ever found your utility. There is the charm of you, Barney McGee. Under conditions that others would stammer in, still unperturbed as a cat or a Cameron, polished as somebody in the Decameron, putting the glamour on price or Pawnee, in your meandering, love and philandering, calm as a mandarin, sipping his tea. Under the art of you, parcel and part of you, here's to the heart of you, Barney McGee. You who were ever alert to befriend a man, you who were ever the first to defend a man, you who had always the money to lend a man down on his luck and hard up for a V. Sure, you'll be playing a harp in beatitude, and a queer sight you will be in that attitude. Some day where gratitude seems but a platitude, You'll find your latitude, Barney McGee. That's no flim-flam at all, frivol or sham at all, just the plain damn it all. Have one with me. Here's one and more to you, friends by the score to you, true to the core to you, Barney McGee. End of Barney McGee. Recording by Marty Chris. Section 5 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenever. The Old Deacon's Version of the Story of the Rich Man and Lazarus by Frank L. Stanton. 
I suppose you know the story, oh my brethren, a demand that was rich as cream and living on the fatness of the land. How he sot there eatin' possum, and when Lazarus axed for some, he tell him, Get away dar, for you never get a crumb. De rich man was a feastin' from his chiny plate and cup, cause he frayed his poor relations come and eat his whittles up. I spec he had two possums on de table long and wide, and a jimmy john a cane juice was a settin' by his side. And he says, Dis here's that suits me, and I gwine to eat my fill. But I'll sick the dogs on Lazarus, if he's waitin' round here still. And the dogs commence their barkin', raise a racket high and low. And when Lazarus see him comin', he decide twas time to go. So he limp off on his crutches, and the rich man think it's fun. But I reckon Lazarus answer, I'll get even with you, son. The rich man so enjoy hisself he laugh hisself to bed, and brethren, when he wake up, he was stiff stone dead. And then he raise a racket and he holler out, "What's dis? De place is unfamiliar, and I wonder where I is." Then Satan he make answer, "I'm de man to tell you dat. You's in de file department and de place I livin' at." Then the rich man say, Where's Lazarus that was begging at my gate? And Satan tell him, Yonder, with a silver spoon and plate. And he's eatin' fit to kill hisself. He's spendin' er the day with good old Mr. Abram, but he mighty fur away. Will you please, sir, said the rich man, ax him bring a drink to me, with a little ice to cool it, cause I hot as hot can be. But Satan fall to laughin', whilst he stir the fire round. The ice would melt my brother, for it ever hit the ground. Then he fill a cup with brimstone, fill it steamin' to the top. But the rich man say he swear off that he'd never touch a drop. But Satan grab his pitchfork, whilst the rich man give a squall, and in about half a second he had swallowed cup and all. Now that's about the story of the rich man at the feast. What wouldn't pass the possum round when Lazarus won a piece? The possum means yo pocketbook. The morrow's plain as day. Shake the dollars in the basket fo you go the rich man's way. End of the old deacon's version of the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Recorded by Phil Chenevere, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Section six of the Wit and Humor of America, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Two Suitors by Carolyn Wells. Once on a time, there was a charming young maiden who had two suitors. One of these, who was of a persistent and persevering nature, managed to be continually in the young lady's company. He would pay her a visit in the morning, drop in to tea in the afternoon, and call on her again in the evening. He took her driving, and he escorted her to the theatre. He would take her to a party, and then he would dance or sit on the stairs, or flit into the conservatory with her. The young lady admired this man, but she wearied of his never-ceasing presence, and she said to herself, if he were not always at my elbow, I should better appreciate his good qualities. The other suitor, who considered himself a man of deep and penetrating cleverness, said to himself, I will go away for a time, and then my fair one will realize my worth, and call me back to her. With a sad visage he made his adieus, and he extracted her pledge to write to him occasionally but after he had gone she forgot her promise, and soon she forgot his very existence. Morals. This fable teaches that absence makes the heart grow fonder, and that out of sight is out of mind. End of The Two Suitors Section 7 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2 this is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Rick Cornwall. The Recruit by Robert W. Chambers. Says Corporal Madden to Private McFadden, Bedad, you're a badden, now turn out your toes. Your belt is on hooked, your cap is on crooked. You may not be drunk, but be jabbers, you look it. One, two, one, two. Ye monkey-faced devil, I'll jolly you through. One, two, time, mark. Ye march like the eagle in Central Park, says Corporal Madden to Private McFadden. A saint it is saddened to drill such a mug. Eyes front, ye baboon, ye. Chin up, ye gossam, ye. You've jaws like a goat. Halt, ye leather-lipped loon, ye. One, two, one, two. Ye whiskered orangutan, I'll fix you. One, two, time, mark. You've eyes like a bat, can you see in the dark? Says Corporal Madden to Private McFadden. Your figure wants padden, sure man, you've no shape. Behind you, your shoulders stick out like two boulders. Your shins is as thin as a pair of pen holders. One, two, one, two. Your belly belongs on your back, you Jew. One, two, time, mark. I'm dreary as a dog, I can't speak, but I bark. Says Corporal Madden to Private McFadden. Me heart it gladden to blacken your eye. You're getting too bold. You compelled me to scold ye. Tis halt that I say. Will ye heed what I told ye? One, two, one, two. Be jabbers, I'm drier than Brian Boru. One, two, time, mark. What's more work for chickens is sport for the lark, says Corporal Madden to Private McFadden. I'll not stay again with dagos like you. I'll travel no further. I'm dying for water. Come on, if you like. Can you loan me a quarter? Yes, you. What? Two? And you'll pay the poteen? You're a daisy. We'll rule. You'll do. Whist, Mark. The regiment's flattered to own ye, me, Spark. End of the Recruit Section 8 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Beecher Beached by John B. Tabb Where Harriet Beecher, well aware of what was done in Delaware, of that unwholesome smell aware, she'd make all heaven and hell aware, and ask John Brown to tell her where, henceforth, she best might sell her where. End of The Beecher Beached Recorded by Patrick Reinhardt Section 9 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Rick Cornwall Our Best Society by Charles William Curtis if guilt were only gold or sugar candy common sense, what a fine thing our society would be. If to lavish money upon objects to virtue, to wear the most costly dresses, and always to have them cut in the height of the fashion, to build houses thirty feet broad as if they were palaces, to furnish them with all the luxurious devices of Parisian genius, to give superb banquets at which your guests laugh and which make you miserable, to drive a fine carriage and ape European liveries and crests and coats of arms, to resent the friendly advances of your baker's wife and the lady of your butcher, you being yourself a cobbler's daughter, to talk much of the old families and of your aristocratic foreign friends, to despise labor, to prate of good society, to travesty and parody in every conceivable way a society which we know only in books and by the superficial observation of foreign travel, which arises out of a social organization entirely unknown to us, and which is opposed to our fundamental and essential principles. If all this were fine, what a prodigiously fine society would ours be. This occurred to us upon lately receiving a card of invitation to a brilliant ball. We were quietly ruminating over our evening fire with Disraeli's Wellington speech, all tears in our hands, with the account of a great man's burial, and a little man's triumph across the channel. 
So many great men gone, we mused, and such great crises impending. This democratic movement in Europe, Kossuth and Mazzini waiting for the moment to give the word, the Russian bear watchfully sucking his paws, the Napoleonic Empire redivivus, Cuba and annexation and slavery, California and Australia, and the consequent considerations of political economy. Dear me, explained we, putting on a fresh hodful of coal, we must look a little into the state of parties. As we put down the coal shuttle, there was a knock at the door, and we said, Come in. And in came a neat Alhambra watered envelope containing the announcement that the Queen of Fashion was at home that evening week. Later in the evening came a friend to smoke a cigar. The card was lying upon the table, and he read it with eagerness. You'll go, of course, said he. For you will meet all the best society. Shall we truly, shall we really see the best society of the city, the picked flower of its genius, character, and beauty? What makes the best society of men and women, the noblest specimens of each, of course, the men who mold the time, who refresh our faith in heroism and virtue, who make Plato and Zeno and Shakespeare and all Shakespeare's gentlemen possible gain? the women whose beauty and sweetness and dignity and high accomplishment and grace make us understand the Greek mythology, and weaken our desire to have some glimpse of the most famous women of history. The best society is that in which the virtues are most shining, which is the most charitable, forgiving, long-suffering, modest, and innocent. The best society is, by its very name, that in which there is the least hypocrisy, an insincerity of all kinds, which recoils from and blasts artificiality, which is anxious to be all that it is possible to be, and which sternly reprobates all shallow pretense, all coxcombry and foppery, and insists upon simplicity as the infallible characteristic of true worth. That is the best society which comprises the best men and women." Had we recently arrived from the moon, we might, upon hearing that we were to meet the best society, have fancied that we were about to enjoy an opportunity not to be overvalued. But unfortunately, we were not so freshly arrived. We had received other cards, and had perfected our toilet many times to meet the same society, so magnificently described, and then found it the least best of all. Who compose it? Whom shall we meet if we go to this ball? we shall meet three classes of person. First, those who are rich, and who have all the money can buy. Second, those who belong to what are technically called the good old families, because some ancestor was a man of mark in the state or country, or was very rich, and has kept the fortune in the family. And thirdly, a swarm of youths who can dance dexterously, and who are invited for that purpose. Now these are all arbitrary and facetious distinctions upon which to found so profound a social difference as that which exists in American, or at least in New York, society. First, as a general rule, the rich men of every community who make their own money are not the most generally intelligent and cultivated. They have a shrewd talent which secures a fortune, and which keeps them closely at the work of amassing from their youngest years until they are old. They are sturdy men, of simple taste often, sometimes, though rarely, very generous, but necessarily with an altogether false and exaggerated idea of the importance of money. They are a rather rough, unsympathetic, and perhaps selfish class, who themselves despise purple and fine linen, and still prefer a cot bed and a bare room, although they may be worth millions. But they are married to scheming or ambitious or disappointed women, whose life is a prolonged pageant and they are dragged hither and thither in it, are bled of their golden blood, and forced into a position they do not covet, and which they despise. Then there are the inheritors of wealth. How many of them inherit the valiant genius and hard frugality which built up their fortunes? How many acknowledge the stern and heavy responsibility of their opportunities? How many refuse to dream their lives away in a Siberian luxury? How many are smitten with the lofty ambition of achieving an enduring name by works of a permanent value? How many do not dwindle into dainty dilettanti, and dilute their manhood with facetious sentimentality instead of a hearty human sympathy? 
how many are not satisfied with having the fastest horses and the crackest carriages and an unlimited wardrobe and a weak affection and puerile imitation of foreign life and who of these of our secondly these old families the spirit of our time and our country knows no such thing but the habituate of society hears constantly of a good family it means simply the collective mass of children grandchildren nephews nieces and descendants of some man who deserved well of his country and whom his country honors but sad is the heritage of a great name the son of burke will inevitably be measured by burke the niece of pope must show some superiority to other women so to speak or her equality is inferiority the feeling of men attributes some magical charm to blood and we look to see the daughter of helen as fair as her mother and the son of shakespeare musical as his sire if they are not so if they are merely names and common persons if there is no burke nor shakespeare nor washington nor bacon in their words or actions or lives then we must pity them and pass gently on not upbraiding them but regretting that it is one of the laws of greatness that it dwindles all things in its vicinity which would otherwise show large enough nay in our regard for the great man we may even admit to a compassionate honor as pensioners upon our charity those who bear and transmit his name but if these heirs should presume upon that fame and claim any precedence of living men and women because their dead grandfather was a hero they must be shown the door directly we should dread to be born a percy or a colonna or a bonaparte we should not like to be the second duke of wellington nor charles dickens jr it is a terrible thing one would say to a mind of honorable feeling to be pointed out as somebody's son or uncle or granddaughter as if the excellence were all derived it must be a little humiliating to reflect that if your great uncle had not been somebody you would be nobody that in fact you are only a name and that if you would consent to change it for the sake of a fortune as is sometimes done you would cease to be anything but a rich man my father was president or governor of the state some pompous man may say but by jupiter king of gods and men what are you is the instinctive response do you not see our pompous friend that you are only pointing out your own unimportance if your father was governor of the state what right have you to use that fact alone to fatten your self-conceit take care good care for whether you say it by your lips or by your life that withering response awaits you then what are you if your ancestor was great you are under bonds to greatness if you are small make haste to learn it betimes and thanking heaven that your name has been made illustrious retire into a corner and keep it at least untarnished our thirdly is a class made by sundry french tailors bootmakers dancing masters and mr brown they are a corps de ballet for use of private entertainments they are fostered by society for the use of young debutantes and hardier damsels who have tr dared two or three years of the tight polka they are cultivated for their heels not their heads their life begins at ten o'clock in the evening and lasts until four in the morning they go home and sleep until nine and then they reel sleepy to accounting houses and offices and doze on desk until dinner time or unable to do that they are actively at work all day and their cheeks grow pale and their lips thin and their eyes bloodshot and hollow and they drag themselves home at evening to catch a nap until the ball begins or to dine and smoke at their club and the very manly with punches and coarse stories and then to rush into hot and glittering rooms and seize very delicate girls closely around the waist and dash with them around an area of stretched linen saying in the panting pauses how very hot it is how very pretty miss podge looks what a good red are you going to miss potiphar's is this the assembled flower of manhood and womanhood called best society and to see which is so envied a privilege if such are the elements can we be long in arriving at the present state and necessary future condition of parties vanity fair is peculiarly a picture of modern society it aims at english follies but its mark is universal as the madness is it is called a satire but after much diligent reading we cannot discover the satire a state of society not at all superior to that of vanity fair 
is not unknown to our experience, and unless truth-telling be satire, unless the most tragically real portraiture be satire, unless scalding tears of sorrow and the bitter regret of a manly mind over the miserable spectacle of artificiality, wasted powers, misdirected energies, and lost opportunities be satirical, we do not find satire in that sad story. The reader closes it with a grief beyond tears. It leaves a vague apprehension in the mind, as if we should suspect the air to be poisoned. It suggests the terrible thought of the enfeebling of moral power and the deterioration of noble character as a necessary consequence of contact with society. Every man looks suddenly and sharply around him, and accosts himself and his neighbors to ascertain if they are all parties to this corruption. Sentimental youths and maidens upon velvet couches or in calf-bound libraries resolve that it is an insult to human nature, are sure that their velvet and calf-bound friends are not like the dramatis personae of Vanity Fair, and that the drama is therefore hideous and unreal. They should remember what they uniformly and universally forgot, that we are not invited upon the rising of the curtain to behold a cosmorama or picture of the world but a representation of that part of it called Vanity Fair. What its just limits are, how far its poisonous purellus reach, how much of the world's air is tainted by it, is a question which every thoughtful man will ask himself with a shudder, and look sadly around to answer. If the sentimental objectors rally again to the charge, and declare that if we wish to improve the world, its virtuous ambition must be piqued, and stimulated by making the shining heights of the ideal more radiant. We reply that none shall surpass us in honoring the men, whose creations of beauty inspire and instruct mankind. But if they benefit the world, it is no less true that a vivid apprehension of the depths into which we are sunken or may sink nerves the soul's courage quite as much as the alluring mirage of the happy heights we may attain. To hold the mirror up to nature, is still the most potent method of shaming sin and strengthening virtue. If Vanity Fair be a satire, what novel of society is not? Are Vivian Gray and Pelham, and the long catalogue of books illustrating English, or the host of Balzac, Sands, Sous, and Dumas, that paint French society, less satires? Nay, if you should catch any dandy in Broadway, or in Pell Mell, or upon the boulevards, this very morning, and write a coldly true history of his life and actions, his doings and undoings, would it not be the most scathing and tremendous satire? If by satire you mean the consuming melancholy of the conviction that the life of that pendant to a mustache is an insult to the possible life of a man. We have read of a hypocrisy so thorough that it was surprised you should think it hypocritical and we have bitterly thought of the saying, when hearing one mother say of another mother's child, that she had made a good match because the girl was betrothed to a stupid boy whose father was rich. The remark was the key of our social feeling. Let us look at it a little, and first of all let the reader consider the criticism and not the critic. We may like very well in our individual capacity to partake of the delicacies prepared by our hostess's chef, we may not be adverse to pâté and midred objets de gout, and if you caught us in a corner of the next ball, putting away a fair share of dindel troughs, we know you would have at us in a tone of great moral indignation, and wish to know why we sneaked into great houses, eating good suppers, and drinking choice wines, and then went away with an indigestion, to write dyspeptic disgust at society. We might reply that it is necessary to know something of a subject before writing about it, and that if a man wished to describe the habits of South Sea Islanders, it is useless to go to Greenland. We might also confess a partiality for pâté, and a tenderness for troughs, and acknowledge that, considering our single absence would not put down extravagant pompous parties, we were not strong enough to let the morsels drop into unappreciating mouths, or we might say that if a man invited us to see his new house, it would not be ungracious nor insulting to his hospitality, to point out whatever weak parts we might detect in it, nor to declare our candid conviction that it was built upon wrong principles and could not stand. He might believe us if we had been in the house, but he certainly would not if we had never been seen it. Nor would it be very wise reply on his part that we might build a better if we didn't like that. 
We are not fond of David's pictures, but we certainly could never paint half so well, nor of Pope's poetry, but posterity will never hear of our verses. Criticism is not construction, it is observation. If we could surpass in its own way everything which displeased us, we should make short work of it, and instead of showing what fatal blemishes deform our present society, we should present a specimen of perfection directly. We went to the brilliant ball. There was too much of everything, too much light, and eating, and drinking, and dancing, and flirting, and dressing, and feigning, and smirking, and much too many people. Good taste insists first upon fitness. But why had Mrs. Potiphar given this ball? We inquired industriously, and learned it was because she did not give one last year. Is it then essential to do this thing biennially? Inquired we with some trepidation. Certainly, was the bland reply. Our society will forget you. Everybody was unhappy at Mrs. Potiphar's, save a few girls and boys who danced violently all the evening. Those who did not dance walked up and down the rooms as well as they could, squeezing by non-dancing ladies, causing them to swear in their hearts, as the brusque broadcloth carried away the light outworks of gauze and gossamer. The dowagers, ranged in solid phalanx, occupied all the chairs and sofas against the wall, and fanned themselves until supper-time, looking at each other's diamonds and criticizing the toilettes of the younger girls, each narrowly watching her peculiar Polly Jane, that she did not betray too much interest in any man who is not of a certain fortune. It is the cold, vulgar truth, madam, nor are we in the slightest degree exaggerating. Elderly gentlemen, twisting single gloves in a very wretched manner, came up and bowed to the dowagers, and smirked, and said it was a pleasant party, and a handsome house, and then clutched their hands behind them, and walked miserably away, looking as affable as possible. And the dowagers made a little fun of the elderly gentlemen among themselves as they walked away. Then came the younger, non-dancing men, a class of the community who wear black cravats and waistcoats, and thrust their thumbs and forefingers in their waistcoat pockets, and are called talking men. Some of them are literary, and affect the philosopher, have perhaps written a book or two, and are a small species of lion to very young ladies. Some are of the blasé kind, men who affect the extremest elegance, and are reputed so aristocratic, and who care for nothing in particular, but wish they had not been born gentlemen, in which case they might have escaped ennui. These gentlemen stand with hat in hand, and their coats and trousers are unexceptional. They are the so gentlemanly persons of whom one hears a great deal, but which seems to mean nothing but cleanliness. Vivian Gray and Pelham are the models of their ambition, and they succeed in being pendinous. They enjoy the reputation of being very clever and very talented fellows, and smart chaps, but they refrain from proving what is so generously conceited. They are often men of a certain cultivation. They have traveled, many of them spending a year or two in Paris, and a month or two in the rest of Europe. Consequently, they endure society at home with a smile and a shrug, and a graceful superciliousness, which is very engaging. They are perfectly at home, and they rather despise young America, which in the next room is diligently earning its imitation. They prefer to hover about the ladies who did not come out this season, but are a little used to the world, with whom they are upon most friendly terms, and they criticize together very freely all the great events of the great world of fashion. These elegant pendences we saw at Mrs. Potiphar's, but not without a sadness which can hardly be explained. They had been boys once, all of them, fresh and frank-hearted, and full of a noble ambition. They had read and pondered the histories of great men, how they resolved and struggled and achieved. In the pure portrait of genius they had loved and honored noble women, and each young heart was sworn to truth and the service of beauty. Those feelings were chivalric and fair. Those boyish instincts clung to whatever was lovely, and rejected the specious snare, however graceful and elegant. They sailed, new knights, upon that old and endless crusade against hypocrisy and the devil, and they were lost in the luxury of Corinth, nor longer seek the difficult shores beyond. A present smile was worth a future laurel, the ease of the moment was worth immortal tranquillity. They renounced the stern worship of the unknown God, and acknowledged the deities of Athens. 
but the seal of their shame is their own smile at their early dreams, and the high hopes of their boyhood, their sneering infidelity of simplicity, their skepticism of motives and of men. Youths, whose younger years were fervid with the resolution to strike and win, who deserve at least a gentle remembrance, if not a dazzling fame, are content to eat and drink and sleep well, to go to the opera and all the balls, to be known as gentlemanly and aristocratic and dangerous and elegant, to cherish a luxurious and enervating indolence, and to succeed upon that cheap reputation of having been fast in Paris. The end of such men is evident enough from the beginning. They are snuffed out by a great match, and became an appendage to a rich woman, or they dwindle off into old ruse, men of the world in sad earnest, and not with elegant affection, blasé, and as they began Arthur Pendencies, so they end the major. But believe it, that old fossil heart is wrung sometimes by a mortal pang, as it remembers those squandered opportunities in that lost life. From these groups we pass into the dancing room. We have seen dancing in other countries and dressing. We have certainly never seen gentlemen dance so easily, gracefully, and well as the American. But the style of dancing in its whirl, its rush, its fury, is only equaled by that of the masked balls at the French opera, and the balls at the Salle Valentino, the Jardin Mabille, the Chaute Rouge, and other favorite resorts of Parisian grusettes and lorettes. We saw a few young men looking upon the dance very soberly, and upon inquiry learned that they were engaged to certain ladies of the corps de ballet. Nor did we wonder that the spectacle of a young woman whirling in a decollete state, and in the embrace of a warm youth, around a heated room, induced a little sobriety upon her lover's face, if not a sadness in his heart. Amusement, recreation, enjoyment. There are no more beautiful things, but this proceeding falls under another head. We watched the various toilettes of these bounding bells. They were rich and tasteful. But a man at our elbow, of experience and shrewd observation, said with a sneer, for which we called him to account, I observe that American ladies are so rich in charms that they are not at all chary of them. It is certainly generous to us miserable black coats. But do you know it strikes me as a generosity of display that must necessarily leave the donor poorer in maidenly feeling. We thought ourselves cynical, but this was intolerable, and in a very crisp manner we demanded an apology. Why, responded our friend with more of sadness than of satire in his tone, why are you so exasperated? Look at this scene. Consider that this is really the life of these girls. This is what they come out for. This is the end of their ambition. They think of it, dream of it, long for it. Is it amusement? Yes, to a few, possibly. But listen and gather, if you can, from their remarks, when they make any, that they have any thought beyond this, and going to church very rigidly on Sunday. The vigor of polkaing and church-going are proportioned. As is the one, so is the other. My young friend, I am no aesthetic, and do not suppose a man is damned because he dances. But life is not a ball, more is the pity truly for these butterflies, nor is it sole duty and delight dancing. When I consider this spectacle, when I remember what a noble and beautiful woman is, what a manly man, when I reel, dazzled by this glare, drunken by these perfumes, confused by these alluring music, and reflect upon the enormous sums wasted in a pompous profusion that delights no one, when I look around upon all this rampant vulgarity and tinsel and Brussels lace, and think how fortunes go, how men struggle and lose the bloom of their honesty, how women hide in a smiling pretense, and eye with caustic glances their neighbor's newer house, diamonds or porcelain, and observe their daughters such as these. Why, I tremble, tremble, and this scene to-night, every cracked ball this winter, will be not the pleasant society of men and women, but even in this young country an orgy such as rotting Corinth saw, a frenzied festival of Rome in its decadence. There was a sober truth in this bitterness, and we turned away to escape the somber thought of the moment, addressing one of the many padding horries who stood melting in a window. We spoke, and confess how absurdly, of the Dusseldorf gallery. It was merely to avoid saying how warm the room was, and how pleasant the party was, facts upon which we were already enlarged. 
Yes, they are pretty pictures, but la, how long it must have taken Mr. Dusseldorf to paint them all, was the reply. By the Farnesian Hercules, no Roman sylph in her city's decline would ever have called the sun-god Mr. Apollo. We hoped that Hori melted entirely away in the window, but we certainly did not stay to see. Passing out toward the supper-room, we encountered two young men. What hell, said one, you at Mrs. Potiphar's? It seems that Hal was a sprig of one of the old families. Well, Joe, said Hal, a little confused, it is a little strange. The fact is, I didn't mean to be here, but I concluded to compromise by coming, and not being introduced to the host. Hal could come, eat Potiphar's supper, drink his wine, spoil his carpets, laugh at his fashionable struggles, and affect the puppyism of a foreign lord, because he disgraced the name of a man who had done some service somewhere while Potiphar was only an honest man who made a fortune. The supper-room was a pleasant place. The table was covered with a chaos of supper. Everything sweet and rare and hot and cold, solid and liquid, was there. It was the very apotheosis of gilt gingerbread. There was a universal rush and struggle. The charge of the guards at Waterloo was nothing to it. Jellies, custard, oyster soup, ice cream, wine and water— gushed in profuse cascades over transparent precepts of tule, muslin, gauze, silk, and satin. Clumsy boys tumbled against costly dresses and smeared them with preserves. When clean plates failed, the contents of plates already used were quietly chucked under the table. Heel taps of champagne were poured into the oyster tureens or overflowed upon plates to cut clear the glasses. Wine of all kind flowed in torrents, particularly down the throats of very young men, who evidenced their manhood by becoming noisy, troublesome, and disgusting, and were finally either led sick into the hat-room, or carried out of the way drunk. The supper over, the young people, attended by their matrons, descended to the dancing-room for the German. This is a dance commencing usually at midnight or a little after, and continuing indefinitely toward daybreak. The young people were attended by their matrons, who were there to supervise the morals and manners of their charges. To secure the performance of this duty, the young people took good care to sit where the matrons could not see them, nor did they by any chance look toward the quarter in which the matrons sat. In that quarter, through all the varying mazes of the prolonged dance, to two o'clock, to three, to four, sat the bediamond dowagers, the mothers, the matrons, against nature, against common sense. They babbled with each other, they drowsed, they dozed. Their fans fell listlessly into their laps. In the adjoining room, out of the waking sight, even of the then sleeping mamas, the daughters whirled in the close embrace of partners who had brought down bottles of champagne from the supper-room, and put them by the side of their chairs for occasional refreshment during the dance. The dizzy hour staggered by. Azalea, you must come now, has been already said a dozen times, but only as by the scribes. Finally it was declared with authority. Azalea went, Amelia, Arabella. The rest followed. There was prolonged cloaking. There were lingering farewells. A few papas were in the supper-room, sitting among the debris of game. A few young non-dancing husbands sat beneath gas, unnaturally bright, reading whatever chance book was at hand and thinking of the young child at home waiting for Mama, who was dancing the German below. A few exhausted matrons sat in the roving room, tired, sad, wishing Jane would come up, assailed at intervals by a vague dis suspicion that it was not quite worth while, wondering how it was they used to have such good times at balls, yawning and looking at their watches, while the regular beat of the music below with sardonic sadness continued. At last Jane came up, had had the most glorious time, and went down with Mama to the carriage, and so drove home. Even the last Jane went, the last noisy youth was expelled, and Mr. and Mrs. Potiphar, having duly performed their biennial social duty, dismissed the music, ordered the servants to count the spoons, and an hour or two after daylight went to bed. Enviable Mr. and Mrs. Potiphar. We are now prepared for the great moral indignation of the friend who saw us eating our dinned of truths in that remarkable supper-room. We are waiting to hear him say in the most moderate and gentlemanly manner that it is all very well to select flaws and present them as specimens, 
and to learn from him, possibly with indignant publicity, that the present condition of parties is not what we have intimated, or in his quiet and pointed way, he may smile at our fiery assault upon edged flounces and nuga pyramids and the kingdom of Lilliput in general. Yet, after all, and despite the youths who are led out and carried home, or who stumble through the German, this is a sober matter. My friend told us we should see the best society. But he is a prodigious wag. Who makes this country? From whom is his character of unparalleled enterprise, heroism, and success derived? Who have given it its place in the respect and the fear of the world? Who annually recruit its energies, confirm its progresses, and secure its triumph? Who are its characteristic children, the pith, the sinew, the bone of its prosperity? Who found and direct and continue its manifold institutions of mercy and education? Who are essentially Americans? Indignant friend, these classes, whoever they may be, are the best society, because they alone are the representatives of its character and cultivation. They are the best society of New York, of Boston, of Baltimore, of St. Louis, of New Orleans. Whether they live upon six hundred or sixty thousand dollars a year, whether they inhabit princely houses in fashionable streets, which they often do, or not, whether their sons have graduated as Solariuses and the Jardin Maybelle, or have never been out of their father's shops, whether they have the air and style and are so gentlemanly and so aristocratic, or not, your shoemaker, your lawyer, your butcher, your clergyman, if they are simple and steady, and whether rich or poor, are unseduced by the sirens of extravagance and ruinous display, help make up the best society. For that mystic communion is not composed of the rich, but of the worthy, and is best by its virtues and not by its vices. When Johnson, Burke, Goldsmith, Garrick, Reynolds, and their friends met at a supper in Goldsmith's room, where was the best society in England? When George the Fourth enraged humanity in his treatment of Queen Caroline, who was the first scoundrel in Europe? Pause yet a moment, indignant friend, whose habits and principles would ruin this country as rapidly as it had been made, who are enamored of a puerile imitation of foreign splendors, who strenuously endeavor to craft the questionable points of Parisian society upon our own, who pass a few years in Europe and return skeptical of republicanism and human improvement, longing and sighing for more sharply emphasized social distinctions, who squander with profuse recklessness the hard-earned fortunes of, of their sires, who diligently devout their time to nothing, foolishly and wrongly supposing that a young English nobleman has nothing to do, who in fine evidence by their collective conduct that they regard their Americanism as a misfortune, and are so at the most deadly enemies of their country. None but what our wag facetiously termed the best society. If the reader doubts, let him consider his practical results in any great emporiums of best society. Marriage is there regarded as a luxury, too expensive for any but the sons of rich men or fortunate young men. We once heard an eminent divine assert, and only half in sport, that the rate of living was advancing so incredibly that weddings in his experience were perceptibly diminishing. The reasons might have been many and various, but we all acknowledge the fact. On the other hand, and about the same time, a lovely damsel, ah, Clorianda, whose father was not wealthy, who had no prospective means of support, who could do nothing but polka to perfection, who literally knew almost nothing, and who constantly shocked every fairly intelligent person by the glaring ignorance portrayed in her remarks, informed a friend at one of the Saratoga balls, whether he had made haste to meet the best society, that there were not more than three good matches in society. La Dame aux Camilles, Marie du Plessis, was to our fancy a much more feminine and admirable and moral and human person than the adored Quaranda. And yet what she said was a legitimate result of the state of our fashionable society. It worships wealth and the pomp which wealth can purchase more than virtue, genius, or beauty. We may be told that it has always been so in every country, and that the fine society of all lands is as profuse and flashy as our own. We deny it flatly. 
neither English nor French nor Italian nor German society is so unspeakably barren as that which is technically called society here. In London and Paris and Vienna and Rome, all the really eminent men and women help make up the mass of society. A party is not a mere ball, but it is a congress of the wit, beauty, and fame of the capital. It is worth while to dress if you shall meet Macaulay, or Hallam, or Guzot, or Thiers, or Landseer, or Della Roche, Mrs. Norton, the Mrs. Berry, Madame Rekheimer, and all the brilliant women and famous foreigners. But why should we desert the pleasant pages of these men, and the recorded gossip of these women, to be squeezed flat against the wall while young dough-faced pours oyster gravy down our shirt front, and Carolyn Pitoy's wonders at Mr. Dusseldorf's industry. If intelligent people decline to go, you justly remark, it is their own fault. Yes, but if they stay away, it is very certainly their great gain. The elderly people are always neglected with us, and nothing surprises intelligent strangers more than the tyrannical supremacy of young America. But we are not surprised at this neglect. How can we be if we have our eyes open? When Carolyn Pitoyes retreats from the floor to the sofa, and instead of a poker, figures at parties as a matron, do you suppose that tough old Joes like ourselves are going to desert the young Caroline upon the floor for Madame Pitoyes upon the sofa? If the pretty young Caroline, with youth, health, freshness, a fine budding form, and wreathe in a semi-transparent haze of flaunced and flowered gauze, is so vapid that we prefer to accost her with our eyes alone, and not with our tongues, is the same Caroline married unto a Madame Pitoyes, and fanning herself upon a sofa, no longer particularly fresh, nor young, nor pretty, and no longer budding, but very fully blown, likely to be fascinating in conversation? We cannot wonder that the whole connection of Petoys, when advanced to the matron's state, is entirely neglected. Proper homage to age we can all pay at home to our parents and grandparents. Proper respect for some person is best preserved by avoiding their neighborhood. And what, think you, is the influence of this extravagant expense and senseless show upon these young men and women, we can easily discover. It saps their noble ambition, assails their health, lowers their estimate of men and their reverence for women, cherishes an eager and aimless rivalry, weakens true feeling, wipes away the bloom of true modesty, and induces an ennui, a satiety, and a kind of dilettante misanthropy, which is the only the more monstrous, because it is undoubtedly real. You shall hear young men of intelligence and cultivation, to whom the unprecedented circumstances of this country offer opportunities of a great and beneficent career, complaining that they were born within this blighted circle, regretting that they were not bakers and tallow chandlers, and under no obligation to keep up appearances, deliberately surrendering all the golden possibilities of that future with this country beyond all others holds before them, sighing that they are not rich enough to marry the girls they love, and bitterly upbraiding fortune that they are not millionaires, suffering the vigor of their years to exhale in, in idle wishes and pointless regrets, disgracing their manhood by lying in wait beyond their so gentlemanly and aristocratic manners, until they can pounce upon a fortune and ensnare an heiress into matrimony, and so having dragged their gifts, their horses of the sun, into a service which shames all their native pride and power, they sink in the mire, and their peers and emulators exclaim that they have made a good thing of it. Are these the processes by which a noble race is made and perpetuated? At Miss Potiphar's we heard several pendences longing for a similar luxury, and announcing their firm purpose never to have wives nor houses until they could have them as splendid as jeweled Mrs. Potiphar in her palace thirty feet front. Where were their heads and their hearts and their arms? How looks this craven despondency before the stern virtues of the ages we call dark, when a man is so voluntarily imbecile as to regret he is not rich, if that is what he wants, before he has struck a blow for wealth, or so dastardly as to renounce the prospect of love, because sitting, sighing, in velvet dressing-gown and slippers, he does not see his way clear to ten thousand a year. When young women coughed at Marvel of exceptional style, who with or without a prospective penny 
secretly look down upon honest women who struggle for a livelihood, like noble and Christian beings, and as such are rewarded, in whose society a man must forget that he has ever read, thought, or felt, who destroy in the mind the fair ideal of woman which the genius of art and poetry and love their inspire has created. Then it seems to us it is high time that the subject should be regarded, not as a matter of breaking butterflies upon the wheel, but as a sad and sober question in whose solution all fathers and mothers and the state itself are interested. When keen observers and men of the world from Europe are amazed and appalled at the giddy whirl and frenzied rush of our society, a society singular in history for the exaggerated prominence it assigns to wealth, irrespective of the talents that amassed it, they and their possessor being usually hustled out of sight, it is not quite time to ponder a little upon the court of Louis the Fourteenth and the merry days of King Charles the Second. Is it not clear that if what our good wag, with caustic irony called best society, were really such, every thoughtful man would read upon Mrs. Potiphar's softly tinted walls the terrible many, many of an eminent destruction? Venice, in her purple prime of luxury, when the famous laws were passed making all gondolas black, that the nobles should not squander fortunes upon them, was not more luxurious than New York today. Our hotels have a superficial splendor, derived from a profusion of gilt and paint, wood and damask. Yet in not one of them can the traveler be so quietly comfortable as in an English inn, and nowhere in New York can the stranger procure a dinner at once so neat and elegant and economical as at the scores of cafes in Paris. The fever of display has consumed comfort. A gondola plated with gold was no easier than a black wooden one. We could well spare a little gilt upon the walls for more cleanliness upon the public table. Nor is it worth while to cover the walls with mirrors to reflect a want of comfort. One prefers a wooden bench to a greasy velvet cushion and a sanded floor to a solid and threadbare carpet. An insipid uniformity is the procrustus bed upon which society is stretched. Every new house is the counterpart of every other, with the exception of more gilt, if the owner can afford it. The interior arrangement, instead of being characteristic, instead of revealing something of the taste and feelings of the owner, is rigorously conformed to every other interior. The same hollow and tame compliance rules in the intercourse of society. Who dares say precisely what he thinks upon a great topic? What youth ventures to say sharp things of slavery, for instance, at a polite dinner-table? What girls dare wear curls when Martel prescribes puffs or bandeau? What specimen of young America dares have his trousers loose or wear straps to them? We want individually heroism, and if necessary an uncompromising persistence in difference. This is the present state of parties. They are widely extravagant, full of senseless display. They are avoided by the pleasant and intelligent, and swarm with reckless regiments of Brown's men. The ends of the earth contribute their choicest pr products to the supper, and there is everything that wealth can purchase, and all the spacious splendor that thirty feet front can afford. They are hot and crowded and glaring. There is a little weak scandal, venomous, not witty, and a stream of weary platitude, mortifying to every sensible person. Will any of our pendennis friends intermit their indignation for a moment, and consider how many good things they have said or heard during the season? If Mr. Potiphar's eyes should chance to fall here, will he reckon the amount of satisfaction and enjoyment be derived from Mrs. Potiphar's ball? And will that lady candidly confess what she gained from it besides weariness and disgust? What elegant sermons we remember to have heard in which the sins and the sinners of Babylon, Jericho, and Gomorrah were scathed with holy indignation. The cloth is very hard upon Cain, and completely routs the erring kings of Judah. The Spanish Inquisition, too, gets frightful knocks, and there is much elegant exhortation to preach the gospel in the interior of Siam. Let it be preached there, and God speed the word, but also let us have a text or two in Broadway in the avenue. The best sermon ever preached upon society, with our, our knowledge, is Vanity Fair. Is the spirit of that story less true of New York than of London? Probably we never see Amelia at our parties, nor Lieutenant George Osborne, nor good gawky Dobbin, nor Mrs. Rebecca Sharp Crawley, nor Old Stein. 
We are very much pained, of course, that any author could take such dreary views of human nature. We, for our parts, all go to Mr. Potiphar's to refresh our faith in men and their women. Generosity, amiability, a Catholic charity, simplicity, taste, sense, high cultivation, and intelligence distinguish our parties. The statesman seeks their stimulating influence. The literary man, after the day's labor, desires the repose of their elegant conversation. The professional man and the merchant hurry up from town to shuffle off the coil of heavy duty and forget the drudgery of life in the agreeable picture of its amenities and graces presented by Mrs. Potiphar's ball. Is this account of the matter, or Vanity Fair, the satire? What are the prospects of any society of which that tale is the true history? There is a picture in the Luxembourg Gallery at Paris, the decadence of the Romans which made the fame and fortune of Courture, the painter. It represents an orgy in the court of a temple during the last days of Rome. A swarm of revelers occupy the middle of the picture, wreathed in elaborate intricacy of luxurious posture, men and women intermingled, their faces in which the old Roman fire scarcely flickers, brutalized with excess of every kind, their heads of disheveled hair bound with coronals of leaves while from goblets of an antique grace they drained the fiery torrent which is destroying them. Around the Bacchanalian feasts stand, lofty upon pedestals, the statues of old Rome, looking with marble calmness and the severity of a rebuke beyond words upon the revelers. A youth of boyish grace, with a wreath woven in his tangled hair and with red and drowsy eyes, sits litzless upon one pedestal, while upon another stands a boy insane with drunkenness, and proffering a dripping goblet to the marble mouth of the statue. In the corner of the picture, as if just quitting the court, Rome finally departing, is a group of Romans with careworn brows, and hands raised to their faces in a melancholy meditation. In the foreground of the picture, which is painted with all the sumptuous splendor of Venetian art, is a stately vase, around which hangs a festoon of gorgeous flowers, its end dragging upon the pavement. In the background, between the columns, smiles the blue sky of Italy, the only thing Italian not deteriorated by time. The careful student of this picture, if he had been long in Paris, is some day startled by detecting, especially in the faces of the women represented, a surprising likeness to the women of Paris, and perceives with a thrill of dismay that the models for this picture of decadent human nature are furnished by the very city in which he lives. End of Our Best Society Recorded by Rick Cornwall Section 10 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. THE TWO FARMERS BY CAROLYN WELLS Once on a time there were two farmers who wished to sell their farms. To one came a buyer who offered a fair price, but the farmer refused to sell, saying he had heard rumors of a railroad which was to be built in his vicinity, and he hoped the corporation would buy his farm at a large figure. The buyer therefore went away, and as the railroad never materialized, the farmer sorely regretted that he lost a good chance. The other farmer sold his farm to the first customer who came along, although he received but a small price for it. Soon afterward, a railroad was built right through the same farm, and the railroad company paid an enormous sum for the land. Morals. This fable teaches that a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, and the patient waiter is no loser. End of The Two Farmers Section 11 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brant Wolf. Samuel Brown by Phoebe Carey it was many a many a year ago, in a dwelling down in town, 
that a fellow there lived whom you may know by the name of Samuel Brown. And this fellow he lived with no other thought than to our house to come down. I was a child, and he was a child, in that dwelling down in town. But we loved with a love that was more than love, I and my Samuel Brown. With a love that the ladies coveted, me and Samuel Brown. And this was the reason that long ago, to that dwelling down in town, a girl came out of her carriage courting my beautiful Samuel Brown, so that her high-bred kinsman came and bore away Samuel Brown, and shut him up in a dwelling house in a street quite up in town. The ladies not half so happy up there when envying me and Brown. Yes, that was the reason, as all men know in this dwelling down in town, that the girl came out of the carriage by night, coquetting and getting my Samuel Brown. But our love is more artful by far than the love, if those who are older than we, of many far wiser than we. And neither the girls that are living above, nor the girls that are down in town, can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Samuel Brown. For the morn never shines without bringing me lines from my beautiful Samuel Brown. And the night's never dark, but I sit in the park with my beautiful Samuel Brown. And often by day I walk down in Broadway, with my darling, my darling, my life and my stay, to our dwelling down in town, to our house in the street downtown. End of Samuel Brown. Section 12 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dennis Smith. The Way It Was by James Whitcomb Riley. Last July, and I presume, about as hot as the old grand jury room, where they sought fight twixt Mike and Doc McGriff. Pears to me just like as if I'd a dreamt the whole blame thing. All this haunts me round the gizzard. When their nightmares on the wing, and a feller's blood is just frizz, seed the row from A to Izzard, cause I was a standin' as close to him as me and you is. Tell you the way it was, and I don't want to see, like some fellers does, when they're goin' to be, any kind of fuss only makes a rumpus wuss, for to interfere when their danders riz but I was a-standin' as close to him as me and you is. I was kind of strayin' past the blame saloon, heard some fiddler playin' that old hiccup tune. Sort of stopped, you know, for a minute or so, and was just about settin' down when Jesus whiz, hold earn winder sash fell out, and there lay Doc McGriff and Mike a-straddlin' him all bloody-like, and both a gettin' down to biz, and I was a standin' as close to him as me and you is. I was the only man around, durn old foggy town, peered more like to me Sunday and Saturday. Dog come cross the road, and took a smell, and put right back. Mishler drive by with a load, a cantaloupes he couldn't sell, too mad he jack, to even ask what was up as he went past. Weather most outrageous hot, fairly hear it sizz. Round Doc and Mike, till Doc he shot, and Mike he slacked that grip of his, and fell all spraddled out, Doc riz, bout half up a spittin' red, and shook his head, and I was standin' as close to him as me and you is. And Doc he says, a whisperin' like, It ain't no use a tryin', Mike, He's just ripped my daylights loose. Get that blamed on fiddler too. Let up and come out here, you. Got some burying to do. Mike makes one, and I expects. In ten seconds I'll make two. And he dropped back where he riz, crossed Mike's body black and blue, like a great big letter X. And I was standing as close to him as me and you is. End of section 12. The Way It Was by James Whitcomb Riley. Read by Dennis Smith.
Section 13 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. She Talked by Sam Walter Foss. She talked of cosmos and of cause, and wove green elephants in gauze, and while she frescoed earthen jugs, her tongue would never pause. On sages wise and esoteric, and bards from Wendell Holmes to Herrick, through time's proud pantheon she walked, and talked and talked and talked and talked. And while she talked, she would crochet and make all kinds of macrame or paint green bobolinks upon her mother's earthen tray. She'd decorate a smelling bottle while she conversed on Aristotle, while fame's proud favorites round her flocked, she talked, and talked, and talked, and talked. She talked, and made embroidered rugs, she talked, and painted lasses' jugs, and worked five sea-green turtle doves on Papa's shaving mugs. With Emerson or Epictetus, Plato or Kant, she used to greet us. She talked until we all were shocked, and talked and talked and talked and talked. She had a lover, and he told the story that is never old. While she, her father's bootjack worked, a lovely green and gold, she switched off on Theocritus, and talked about Democritus, and his most ardent passion balked, and talked and talked and talked and talked. He begged her to become his own. She talked of ether and ozone, and painted yellow poodles on her brother's razor hone. Then talked of Noah and Nebuchadnezzar, and Timon and Tiglath Pileser, while he at her heart portals knocked. She talked and talked and talked and talked. He bent in love's tempestuous gale. She talked of strata and of shale, and worked magenta poppies on her mother's water pail. And while he talked of passion's power, she amplified on Schopenhauer. A pistol flashed. He's dead. Unshocked, she talked and talked and talked and talked. End of She Talked. Read by Patrick Reinhardt. Section 14 of The Wit and Humor of America. Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Grandma Keeler Gets Grandpa Ready for Sunday School by Sarah P. McLean Green. Read by Marty Chris. Sunday morning nothing arose in Wallencamp save the sun. At least that celestial orb had long forgotten all the roseate flaming of his youth in an honest straightforward march toward the heavens ere the first signs of smoke came curling lazily up from the Wallencamp chimneys. I had retired at night very weary with the delicious consciousness that it wouldn't make any difference when I woke up the next morning or whether indeed I woke at all. So I opened my eyes leisurely and lay half dreaming, half meditating on a variety of things. I deciphered a few of the texts on the scriptural patchwork quilt which covered my couch. There were, Let not your heart be troubled, Remember Lot's wife, and Philander Keeler, traced in inky hieroglyphics, all in close conjunction. Finally I reached out for my watch, and having ascertained the time of day, I got up and proceeded to dress hastily enough, wondering to hear no signs of life in the house. I went noiselessly down the stairs. All was silent below except for the peaceful snoring of Mrs. Philander and the little Keelers, which was responded to from some remote western corner of the ark by the triumphant snores of Grandma and Grandpa Keeler. I attempted to kindle a fire in the stove, but it sizzled a little while, spitefully, as much to say, What, Sunday morning? Not I, and went out. So I concluded to put on some wraps and go out and warm myself in the sun. I climbed the long hill back of the ark, descended, and walked along the bank of the river. It was a beautiful morning. The air was everything that could be desired in the way of air, but I felt a desperate need of something more substantial. 
Standing alone with nature on the bank of the lovely river, I thought, with tears in my eyes, of the delicious breakfast already recuperating the exhausted energies of my faraway home friends. When I got back to the house, Mrs. Philander, in simple and unaffected attire, was bustling busily about the stove. The snores from Grandma and Grandpa's quarter had ceased, signifying that they also had advanced the stage in the grand processes of Sunday morning. The children came teasing me to dress them, so I fastened for them a variety of small articles, which I flattered myself on having combined in a very ingenious and artistic manner, though I believe those infant keelers went weeping to Grandma afterward, and were remodeled by her all-comforting hand with much skill and patience. In the midst of her preparations for breakfast, Madeline abruptly assumed her hat and shawl, and was seen from the window, walking leisurely across the fields in the direction of the woods. She returned in due time, bearing an armful of fresh evergreens, which she twisted around the family register. When the ancient couple made their appearance, I remarked silently in regard to Grandma Keeler's hair what proved afterward to be its usual holiday morning arrangement. It was confined to six infinitesimal braids, which appeared to be sprouting out perpendicularly in all directions from her head. The effect of redundancy and expansiveness thus heightened and increased on Grandma's features was striking in the extreme. While we were eating breakfast, that good soul observed to Grandpa Keeler, "'Wow, Pa, I suppose you all be ready when the sub comes to take teacher and me over to West Wallen to Sunday school, won't ye?' Grandpa coughed and coughed again, and raised his eyes helplessly to the window. "'Looks some like showers,' said he. <clears throat> "'Looks mightily to me like showers over yonder.' "'Thy really, husband, I must say I feel mortified for ye,' said Grandma. "'Seeing as how you're a professor, too, and there ain't been a single Sunday morning since I lived with ye, Pa, summer or winter, but what you've seen showers, and the trolley seems to me it's dreadful inconsistent when there ain't no cloud in the sky and don't look no more like rain than I do.' And Grandma's face, in spite of her reproachful tones, was, above all, blandly sunlike and expressive of anything rather than a deluge and watery disaster. Grandpa was silent a little while, then coughed again. I had never seen Grandpa in worse straits. <laughs> Fanny seems to be a little lame this morning, said he. I shouldn't wonder. She's been going pretty steady this week. It does beat all, Pa, continued Grandma Keeler, how tall the horses you ever had since I have known ye have always been took lame Sunday morning. That was Happy Jack. He could go anywhere through the week and never limp a step as nobody could see, and Sunday morning he was always took lame. And there was Tantrum. Tantrum was the horse that had run away with Grandma when she was thrown from the wagon and generally smashed to pieces. And now Grandma branched off into the thrilling reminiscences connected with this incident of her life, which was the third time during the week that the horrible tale had been repeated for my delectation. When she had finished, Grandpa shook his head with painful earnestness, reverting to the former subject of discussion. "'It's a long jaunt,' said he. "'A long jaunt.' "'There's a long hill to climb before we reach Zion's Mount,' said Grandma Keeler impressively. "'Well, there's a darn sight harder one on the road to West Wallen,' burst out the old sea captain desperately. "'Say nothing about the devilish stones.' "'There now,' said Grandma, with calm and awful reproof. "'I think we've gone far enough for one day. "'We've broke the Sabbath and took the name of the Lord in vain, "'and that ought to be enough for professors.' Grandpa replied at length in a greatly subdued tone, well, if you and the teacher want to go to Sunday school today, I suppose we can go if we get ready. A long submissive sigh. I suppose we can. They have preaching service in the morning, I suppose, said Grandma, but we don't generally get along to that. It makes such an early start. We generally try to get around when we go in time for Sunday school. They have singing and all. It's just about as interesting, I think, as preaching. The old man really likes it, she observed aside to me, when he once gets started, but he kind of dreads the getting started. 
When I beheld the ordeal through which Grandpa Keeler was called to pass at the hands of his faithful consort, before he was considered in a fit condition of mind and body to embark for the sanctuary, I marveled not at the old man's reluctance, nor that he had indeed seen clouds and tempest fringing the horizon. Immediately after breakfast he set out for the barn, ostensibly, to see to the chores, really, I believe, to obtain a few moments' respite before worse evils should come upon him. Pretty soon Grandma was at the back door, calling in firm, though persuasive, tones. "'Husband! Husband! Come in now and get ready!' No answer. Then it was in another key, weighty, yet expressive of no weak irritation that Grandma called. "'Come, Pa! Pa! Pa!' Still no answer. Then that voice of Grandma sung out like a trumpet, terrible with meaning. Be Jonah Keeler! But Grandpa appeared not. Next I saw Grandma slowly but surely gravitating in the direction of the barn, and soon she returned, bringing with her that ancient delinquent who looked like a lost sheep indeed and a truly unreconciled one. Now the first thing, said Grandma, looking her forlorn captive over, is boots. Go and get your meeting gaiters, Pa. The old gentleman, having dutifully invested himself with those sacred relics, came pathetically limping into the room. I declare, Ma, said he, somehow these things, ugh, somehow they pinch my feet dreadfully. I don't know what it is, but ugh, they're dreadful uncomfortable things somehow. "'Since I've known ye, Pa,' solemnly ejaculated Grandma Keeler, "'you've never had a pair of meetin' boots that set easy on your feet. "'You ought to get boots big enough for ye, Pa,' she continued, "'looking down disapprovingly on the old gentleman's pedal extremities, "'which resembled two small scowls at anchor in black cloth encasements. "'And not be so proud as to go pinchin' your feet into gaiters "'a number of sizes too small for ye.' "'They're number tens, I tell ye,' roared Grandpa, nettled outrageously by this cutting taunt. "'Well, there now, Pa,' said Grandma soothingly. "'If I had such feet as that, I wouldn't go spreading it all over town if I was you. But it's time we stop bickering now, husband, and get ready for the meeting, so sit down and let me wash your head.' "'I've washed once this morning. It's clean enough,' Grandpa protested, but in vain. He was planted in a chair, and Grandma Keeler, with rag and soap and a basin of water, attacked the old gentleman vigorously, much as I've seen cruel mothers wash the faces of their earth-begrimed infants. He only gave expression to such groans as, "'There, Ma, don't tear my ears to pieces. Come, Ma, you've got my eyes so full of soap now, Ma, I, I can't see nothing.' Phew! Lordy, ain't ye most through with this, Ma? Then came the dying process, which Grandma Keeler assured me, aside, made Grandpa look like a man of thirty. But to me, after it, he looked neither old nor young, human nor inhuman, nor like anything that I had ever seen before under the sun. There's the lotion, the potion, the dyer, and the setter, said Grandma, pointing to four bottles on the table. Now, where's the directions, Madeline? These having been produced from between the leaves of the family Bible, Madeline read while Grandma made a vigorous practical application of the various mixtures. This admirable lotion, in soft, ecstatic tones, Madeline rehearsed the flowery language of the recipe. Though not so instantaneously startling in its effect as our inestimable dryer and setter, yet forms a most essential part of the whole process, opening as it does the dry and lifeless pores of the scalp, imparting to them new life and beauty, and rendering them more easily susceptible to the applications which follow but we must go deeper than this a tone must be given to the whole system by means of the cleansing and rejuvenating of the very centre of our beings and for this purpose we have prepared our wonderful potion here grandpa with a wry face was made to swallow a spoonful of the mixture our unparalleled dyer 
madeline continued restores black hair to a more than original gloss and brilliancy and gives to the faded golden tress the sunny flashes of youth grandpa was dyed our world-renowned setter completes and perfects the whole process by adding tone and permanency to the efficacious qualities of the lotion potion and dyer etc while on grandpa's head the unutterable dye was set now read teacher some of the testimonials daughter said grandma keeler whose face was one broad generous illustration of that rare and peculiar virtue called faith so madeline continued mrs hiram briggs of north dedham writes i was terribly afflicted with baldness so that for months i was little more than an outcast from society and an object of pity to my most familiar friends i tried every remedy in vain at length i heard of your wonderful restorative after a week's application my hair had already begun to grow in what seemed the most miraculous manner at the end of ten months it had assumed such length and proportions as to be a most luxurious burden and where i had before been regarded with pity and aversion i became the envied and admired of all beholders just think said grandma keeler with rapturous sympathy and gratitude how that poor creature must have felt orion spalding of weedsville vermont madeline went on but here i had to beg to be excused and went to my room to get ready for the sunday school when i came down again grandpa keeler was seated completely arrayed in his best clothes opposite grandma who held the big family bible in her lap and a sunday school question book in one hand now paul said she what tribe was it in sacred writ that wore bunnets i was compelled to infer from the tone of grandpa keeler's answer that his temper had not undergone a mollifying process during my absence come ma said he how much longer are you going to pester me in this way why paul grandma rejoined calmly until you get a proper understanding of it what tribe was it in sacred writ that wore bunnets lordy exclaimed the old man how do you suppose i know they must have been a tarnal old woman looking set anyway the tribe of judah paul said grandma gravely now how good it is husband to have your understanding all freshened up for the scriptures come come ma said grandpa rising nervously it's time we was startin when i make up my mind to go anywhere i always want to get there in time if i was going to the old harry i should want to get there in time it's my concern that we get there before time some on us said grandma with sad meaning unless we learn to use more respectful language i shall never forget how we set off for church that sabbath morning way out at one of the sunny back doors of the ark for there was madeline's little cottage that fronted the highway or lane and then there was a long backward extension of the ark only one story in height this belonged particularly to grandma and grandpa keeler it contained the parlor and the three keepin' rooms open one into the other all the same size and general bare and gloomy appearance all possessing the same sacredly preserved atmosphere through which we passed with becoming silence and solemnity into the end room the sunny kitchen where grandma and grandpa kept house by themselves in the summer time and there at the door her very yellow coat reflecting the rays of the sun stood fanny presenting about as much appearance of life and animation as a pensive summer squash the carriage i thought was a facsimile of one in which i had been brought from west wallen on the night of my arrival one of the most striking peculiarities of this sort of vehicle was the width at which the wheels were set apart the body seemed comparatively narrow it was very long and covered with white canvas it had neither windows nor doors but just the one guarded opening in front there were no steps leading to this and indeed a variety of obstacles before it and the way grandma effected an entrance was to put a chair on a mound of earth and a cricket on top of the chair 
and thus having climbed up to Fanny's reposeful back, she slipped passively down, feet foremost, to the whiffle tree, from thence she easily gained the plane of the carriage floor. Grandpa and I took a less circuitous, though perhaps not a less difficult, route. I sat with Grandpa on the front seat. It may be remarked that the front seat was very much front, and the back seat very much back. There was a kind of wooden shelf built outside as a resting place for the feet, so that while our heads were under cover, our feet were out, utterly exposed to the weather, and we must either lay them on the shelf or let them hang off into space. Madeline and the children stood at the door to see us off. "'All aboard! Ship ballasted! Wind far ahead, thar Fanny!' shouted Grandpa, who seemed quite restored in spirits, and held the reins and wielded the whip with a masterful air. He spun sea-yarns, too, all the way, marvelous ones, and Grandma's reproving voice was mellowed by the distance, and so confusedly mingled with the rumbling of the wheels that it seemed hardly to reach him at all. Not that Grandma looked discomfited on this account, or in bad humor. On the contrary, as she sat back there in the ghostly shadows with her hands folded and her hair combed out in resplendent waves on either side of her head, she appeared conscious that every word she uttered was taking root in some obdurate heart. She was, in every respect, the picture of good will and contentment. But the face under Grandpa's antiquated beaver began to give me a fresh shock every time I looked up at him, for the light and the air were rapidly turning his rejuvenated locks and his poor thin fringe of whiskers to an unnatural greenish tint, while his bushy eyebrows, untouched by the hand of art, shone as white as ever. In spite of the old sea captain's entertaining stories, it seemed indeed a long jaunt to Westfallen. To say that Fanny was a slow horse would be but a feeble expression of the truth. A persevering click-click-click began to arise from Grandma's quarter. This annoyed Grandpa exceedingly. "'Shut up, Ma!' he was moved to exclaim at last. "'I'm steering this craft!' Click-click-click came perseveringly from behind. "'Dumb it, Ma! There, Ma!' cried Grandpa, exasperated beyond measure. "'How is this hoss going to hear anything I say if you keep such a tarnal cackling?' Just as we were coming out of the thickest part of the woods, about a mile beyond Wallencamp, we discovered a man walking in the distance. It was the only human being we had seen since we started. "'Hello! There's Lovell,' said Grandpa. "'I was wondering why we hadn't overtook him before. We generally get him in on the road. Yes, yes, that's Lovell, ain't a teacher?' I put up my glasses helplessly. "'I'm sure,' I said. "'I can't tell positively. I have seen Mr. Barlow but once, and at that distance I shouldn't know my own father.' "'It must be Lavelle,' said Grandpa. "'Yes, I know him. Hello there! Ship ahoy! Ship ahoy!' Grandpa's voice suggested something of the fire and vigor it must have had when it rang out across the foam of waves and pierced the tempest's roar. The man turned and looked at us, and then went on again. "'He didn't seem to recognize us,' said Grandma. "'Ship ahoy! Ship ahoy!' shouted Grandpa. The man turned and looked at us again, and this time he stopped and kept on looking. When we got up to him we saw that it wasn't Lovell Barlow at all, but a stranger of trampish appearance, drunk and fiery, and fixed in an aggressive attitude. I was naturally terrified. What if he should attack us on that lonely spot? Grandpa was so old, and moreover, Grandpa was so taken aback to find that it wasn't Lavelle that he began some blunt and stammering expression of surprise, which only served to increase the stranger's ire. Grandma, imperturbable soul, who never failed to come to the rescue even in the most desperate emergencies, Grandma climbed over the front, thrust out her benign head, and said in that deep, calm voice of hers, "'We're a-going to the house of God, brother.' "'Won't you get in and go, too?' "'No,' replied our brother, doubling up his fists and shaking them menacingly in our faces. "'I won't go to no house of God. What do you mean by overhauling me on the road and asking me to get into your d d old traveling lunatic asylum?' "'Drive on, Paul,' said Grandma coldly. "'He ain't in no condition to be labor with now. Drive on kind of quick.' 
kind of quick we could not go but family was made to do her best and we did not pause to look behind when we got to the church sunday school had already begun there was lavelle barlow looking preternaturally stiff in his best clothes sitting with a class of young men he saw us when we came in and gave me a look of deep meaning it was the same expression as though there was some solemn mutual understanding between us which he had worn on that night when he gave me his picture there's plenty of young folks classes said grandma but seeing as we're late maybe you just as soon go right along in with us i said that i would like that best so i went into the old folks class with grandma and grandpa keeler there were three pews of old people in front of us and the teacher who certainly seemed to me the oldest person i had ever seen sat in an otherwise vacant pew in front of all so that his voice being very thin and querulous we could only hear very little what he said although we were edified in some faint sense by his pious manner of shaking his head and rolling his eyes toward the ceiling the church was a square wooden edifice of medium size and contained three stoves all burning brightly against this and the drowsy effect of their long drive in the sun and wind my two companions proved powerless to struggle grandpa looked furtively up at grandma then endeavored to put on as a sort of apology for what he felt was inevitably coming a sanctimonious expression which was most unnatural to him and which soon faded away as the sweet unconsciousness of slumber overspread his features his head fell back helplessly his mouth opened wide he snored but not very loudly i looked at grandma wondering why her vigilance had failed on this occasion and lo her head was falling peacefully from side to side she was fast asleep too she woke up first however and then grandpa was speedily and adroitly aroused by some means i think it was a pin and grandma fed him with bits of unsweetened flag root which he munched penitently though evidently without relish until he dropped off to sleep again and she dropped off to sleep again and so they continued but it always happened that grandma woke up first and whereas grandpa when the avenging pin pierced his shins recovered himself with a start and an air of guilty confusion grandma opened her eyes at regular intervals with the utmost calm and placidity as though she had merely been closing them to engage in a few moments of silent prayer end of grandma keeler gets grandpa ready for sunday school reading by marty chris Section 15 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Rees. Viva la Bagatelle by Gillette Burgess. Sing a song of foolishness, laughing stocks, and cranks. The more there are, the merrier. Come, join the ranks life is dry and stupid whoop her up a bit donkeys live in clover bray and throw a fit take yourself in earnest never stop to think strut and swagger boldly dress in red and pink prate of stuff and nonsense get yourself abused someone's got to play the fool to keep the crowd amused bully for the idiot bully for the guy you could be a prig yourself if you would only try. Altruistic asses keep the fun alive. Clowns are growing scarcer. Hurry and arrive. I seen a crazy critic, a writin' of a screed, tendencies and unities. Major Link indeed. He wore a paper collar, and his tie was up behind. If that's the test of culture, then I'm glad I'm not refined. Let me laugh at you, then you can laugh at me. Then we'll josh together everything we see. Everyone's a nincompoop to another's view. Laughter makes the sunshine. Roop de doodle do. End of Viva la Bagatelle. Recording by Matthew Reese, Davenport, Iowa. Section 16 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
Recording by Brant Wolf. The Two Brothers by Carolyn Wells. Once on a time there were two brothers who set out to make their way in the world. One was of a roving disposition, and no sooner had he settled down to live in one place than he would gather up all his goods and chattels and move to another place. From here again he would depart and make him a fresh home, and so on until he became an old man and had gained neither fortune nor friends. The other, being disinclined to change or diversity of scene, remained all his life in one place. He therefore became narrow-minded and provincial, and gained none of the culture and liberality of nature, which comes from contact with various scenes of life. Morals, this fable teaches that a rolling stone gathers no moss, and a setting hen never grows fat. End of the Two Brothers Section 17 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. Read by Dennis Smith. A letter from Petroleum V. Nasby. I am requested to act as chaplain of the Cleveland Convention that beautiful city visited for that purpose. Post Office Confederate Crossroads, which is in the state of Kentucky, September 20th, 1866. I was sent for to come to Washington from my comfortable quarters at the post office to attend the convention of such soldiers and sailors of the United States as believe in a union of 36 states and who have sworn allegiance to a flag with thirty-six stars on to it at Cleveland. My esteemed and lifelong friend and co-laborer, Rev. Henry Ward Beecher, was to have been the chaplain of the convention, but he failed us, and it was decided in a cabinet meeting that I should take his place. I didn't see the necessity of having a chaplain at every little convention of our party, and so stated, but Stewart remarked, with a groan, that if ever there was a party, since parties was invented, which needed praying for, ours was that party. And parson, said he, glancing at a list of delegates, if you have any agonizing petitions, any prayers of extra fervency, offer em up for these fellers. If there is any efficacy in prayer, it's my honest, unbiased opinion that there never was in the history of the world, nor never will be again, such a magnificent chance to make it manifest. Try yourself particularly on Custer, though after all, continued he, in a musing, abstracted sort of way, which he's fallen into lately, the fellow is such a trifling being that he really can hardly be held sponsible for what he's doing, and the balance of em, good heavens, they're mostly drove to it by hunger and the secretary maundered on something about sixty days and ninety days, paying no more attention to the rest of us as if we wasn't there at all. So, receiving transportation and sufficient money from the Secret Service Fund for expenses, I departed for Cleveland, and after a tedious trip through an abolition country, I arrived there. My thoughts were gloomy beyond expression. I had recently gone through this same country as chaplain to the presidential tour, and every station had its peculiar unpleasant remembrances. Here was where the cheers for Grant were vociferous, with nary a snort for His Excellency. There was where the peasantry laughed in his face when he went through the regular ritual of presenting the Constitution and the flag with thirty-six stars unto it to a district assessor. There was... But why recount my sufferings? Why harrow up the public bosom, or lacerate the public mind? Suffice to say, I endured it. Suffice to say that I had strength left to ride up Bank Street in Cleveland, the scene of the most awful insult the executive ever received. The evening I arrived, the delegates, such as was on hand, held an informal meeting to arrange matters so as they would work smooth when the crowd finally got together. General Wool was as gay and frisky as though he really belonged to the last generation. There was Custer, of Michigan, with his hair freshly oiled and curled, and bustling about as though he had cheated himself into the belief that he really amounted to something. And there was seventy-eight other men, 
who had distinguished themselves in the late war, but who had never got their deserts, except in by brevet, owing to the fact that the administration was abolition, which they wasn't. They were, in a pecuniary point of view, something the worse for wear, though why that should have been the case I couldn't see, they having been, to an alarming extent, quartermasters and commissaries, and in the recruiting service, till I noticed the prevailing color of their noses, and heard one of em ask his neighbor if Cleveland was blessed with a faro bank. Then I knowed all about it. There was another peculiarity about it which for a time amused me. Them as was present was divided into two classes, those as had been recently appointed to positions, and them as expected to be shortly. I noticed on the countenances of the first class a look of relief, such as I have seen in factories on Saturday night, after the hands was paid off for a hard week's work, and on the other class the most wolfish, hungry, fierce expression I have ever witnessed. Likewise, I noticed that the latter set of patriots talked more hefty of the necessity of sustaining the policy of our firm and noble president, and damned the abolitionists with more emphasis and fervency than the others. One enthusiastic individual, who had been quartermaster two years, and had been allowed to resign just after the battle, mother, which, having his papers all destroyed, made settling with the government an easy matter, was so ferocious that I felt called upon to check him. "'Gently, my friend,' said I, "'gently. I have been through this thing. I have my commission. It broke out on me just as it has on you. But you won't get your assessorship a minute sooner for it. It ain't a assessorship I want, says he. I have devoted myself to the task of binding up the wounds of my beloved country. Did you stop anybody very much from inflicting them said wounds? murmured I. And if I accept the post office in my native village, which I have been solicited so strongly to take that I have finally yielded, I do it only that I may devote my few remaining energies wholly to the great cause of restoring the thirty-six states to their normal positions under the flag with thirty-six stars on to it, in spite of the Judas Iscariots, which, if I am whom, what is the Saviour, and, and where is... Perceiving that the unfortunate man had got into the middle of a quotation from the speech of our noble and patriotic president, and knowing his intellect wasn't hefty enough to get it off just as it was originally delivered, I took him by the throat and shut off the flood of his eloquence. "'Be quiet, you idiot,' remarked I, soothingly to him. "'You'll get your appointment, because, for the first time in the history of this or any other republic, there is a market for just such men as you, but all this blather won't fetch it a minute sooner.' "'Good Lord,' thought I, as I turned away, "'what a president A.J. is, to have to buy up such cattle. What a postmaster he must be, whose general cussedness turns my stomach. It was deemed necessary to see of what we was composed. Whatever Colonel K., who was now collector of revenue in Illinois, asked if there was ary a man in the room who had been a prisoner during the late fratricidal struggle. A gentleman of perhaps thirty arose, and said he was. He had been taken three times, and was, altogether, eighteen months in durance vile in three different prisons. Custer fell on his neck and asked him agitatedly if he was sure, quite sure, after suffering all that, that he supported the policy of the President. "'Are you quite sure, quite sure?' "'I am,' returned the phenomenon. "'I stand by Andrew Johnson and his policy, and I don't want no office.' "'Have you got one?' shouted they all in chorus. "'Nary,' said he. "'With me it is a matter of principle.' "'What prisons was you incarcerated in?' asked I, looking at him with wonder. First at Camp Morton, then at Camp Douglas, and finally at Johnson's Island.' Custer dropped him, and the rest remarked that, while they had a very healthy opinion of him, they guessed he'd better not mention his presence, or consider himself a delegate. As generous foes they loved him rather better than a brother, yet, as the call didn't quite include him, though there was a delightful oneness between them, Yet, if t'was all the same, he had better not announce hisself. He was from Kentucky, I afterwards ascertained. The next morning, something over two hundred more arrived, and the delegations being all in, it was decided to go on with the show. A big tent had been brought in from Boston, to accommodate the expected crowd, 
and quite an animated discussion arose as to which corner of it the convention was to occupy. This settled, the business was begun. General Wool was made temporary chairman, to which honor he responded in an eloquent extemporaneous speech, which he read from manuscript. General Ewing made another extemporaneous address, which he read from manuscript, and we adjourned for dinner. The dinner hour was spent in caucusing privately in one of the parlors of the hotel. The chairman asked who should make speeches after dinner, when every man of them pulled up from his right side coat pocket a roll of manuscript, and said he had jotted down a few IGs which he had concluded to present extemporaneously to the convention. That babble over, the chairman said he presumed someone should be selected to prepare a address, whereupon every delegate rose and pulled a roll of manuscript from his left side coat pocket, and said he had jotted down a few IGs on the situation, which he proposed to present, etc. This occasioned another shindy, when the chairman remarked, Resolutions, when every delegate rose, pulled a roll of manuscript from his right breast-coat pocket, and said he had jotted down a few IGs, which, etc. I stood it until someone mentioned me as chaplain to the expedition west, when the pressure become unendurable. They supposed I was keeper of the President's conscience, and I had not a minute's peace after that. In vain I assured them that, there being no consciences about the White House, no one could hold such a office. In vain I assured them that I had no influence with His Majesty. Two-thirds of them pulled applications for places they wanted from the left breast-coat pocket, and insisted on my taking them, and seemed that they was appointed. I told them that I could do nothing for them, but they laughed me to scorn. "'You are just the style of man,' said they, "'who has influence with His Excellency, and you must do it.' Hemmed in, there was but one way of escape, and that way I took. Seizing a carpet-sack, which, by the way, belonged to a delegate, I took it to give myself the look of a traveler. I rushed to the depot and started home entirely satisfied that if Cleveland may be taken as a sample, the less His Majesty depends on soldiers, the better. Petroleum V. Nasby, P.M., which is Postmaster, and likewise late chaplain to the expedition. P.S. I opened the carpet sack on the train, expecting to find a clean shirt in it, at least. It contained, to my disgust, an address to be read before the Cleveland Convention, a set of resolutions, a speech, and a petition of the proprietor thereof for a collectorship, signed by eight hundred names, and a copy of the Indiana State Directory for 1864. The names was in one handwriting, and was arranged alphabetically. Petroleum v. Nasby End of Section 17 A Letter from Petroleum v. Nasby Read by Dennis Smith Section 18 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Smith. Familiar Authors at Work by Hayden Carruth. Miss Tripp. Miss Tripp for years has lived alone, without display or fuss or pother. The house she dwells in is her own. She got it from her dying father. Miss T. delights in all good works. She goes to church three times on Sunday. Her daily duty never shirks, nor keeps her goodness for this one day. She loves to bake and knit and sew. For wider fields she doesn't hanker. Yet for the things they have, I know a many poor folk have to thank her. The simple life she truly leads. She loves her small domestic labors. In spring she plants her garden seeds, and shares the product with her neighbors. By books and authors, now I see, in literature she's made a foray. The Yellow Shadow, said to be a crackerjack detective story. Captain Brown. Bluff Captain Brown is somewhat queer, but of the sea he's very knowing. I scarcely meet him once a year, 
he's off in search of whales a-blowing. For fifty years, perhaps for more, he sailed about upon the ocean. He thinks that he lived ashore, he die, but this is just a notion. Still, when the captain comes to port, with barrows of oil from whales caught napping, he'll pace the deck and loudly snort. This land air is my strength of sappin. I call this livin' on hard terms. I wish that I had never seen land. I wish I were a-chasing sperms abaft the north coast of Greenland. Yet, on his latest cruise, tween whales, the captain wrote a book most charming. It's called, and it is having sails, Some Practical Advice on Farming. T. H. Smith Tom Henry Smith I long have known, although he really is a hermit. At least, Tom Henry lives alone, and that's what people always term it. Tom Henry never is annoyed by fashion's change. He wears a collar constructed out of celluloid. His hats ne'er cost above a dollar. Tom loves about his room to mess, and cook a sausage at the fireplace. It doesn't serve to help his dress. Grease splatters over the entire place. Tom Henry likes to read a book, and writes a little for the papers, but scarcely ever leaves his nook, and takes no part in social capers. Now Tom has penned a book himself. I hope he'll never feel compunctions. Its title is, it's on my shelf, Pink Teas and Other Social Functions. Ruth Jones I found the Joneses pleasant folk. I've watched them all their children fetch up. Jones loves to have a quiet smoke. She's famous for tomato ketchup. Ruth is their eldest, now fifteen, a tallish girl with pleasing features. Each school day morn she can be seen as she trips by to meet her teachers. A serious-minded miss, you'd say, not given much to schoolgirl follies. She still sometimes will slip away to spend a half hour with her dollies. She's learned to sweep, to sew, to bake. She's quite a helpmate to her mother. On Saturday she loves to take the go-kart out with her little brother. At writing now she bids for fame. Her book a great success is reckoned. By right of flashing sword, its name. A strong romance of James the Second. End of Familiar Authors at Work Recording by Robert Smith Section 19 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brant Wolf The Lost Word by John Paul Seated one day at the typewriter, I was weary of A's and E's, and my fingers wandered wildly over the consonant keys. I know not what I was writing, with that thing so like a pen, but I struck one word astounding, unknown to the speech of men. It flooded the senses of my verses like the break of a tinker's dam, and I felt as one feels when the printer of your infinite calm makes clam. It mixed up S's and X's, like an alphabet coming to strife. It seemed the discordant an echo of a row between husband and wife. It brought a perplexed meaning into my perfect peace and set the machinery creaking as though it were scant of grease. I have tried, but I try it vainly, the one last word to divine, which came from the keys of my typewriter and so would pass as mine. It may be some other typewriter will produce that word again, it may be but only for others. I shall write henceforth with a pen. End of the Lost Word Section 20 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere the Dutchman Who Had the Smallpox by Henry P. Leland Very dry indeed is the drive from Blackberry to Squash Point, dry even for New Jersey. 
and when you remember that it's fifty miles between the two towns, its division into five drinks seems very natural. When you are packed three on one narrow seat in a Jersey stage, it is necessary. A Jersey stage. It is not on record, but when Dante winds up his tenth canter into the inferno with each as his back was laden came indeed, or more or less contracted, and it seemed as he who showed most patience in his look, wailing, exclaimed, I can endure no more. The conclusion that he alluded to a crowded Jersey stage load is irresistible. A man with long legs on a back seat in one of these vehicles suffers like a snipe shut up in a snuff-box. For this reason the long-legged man should sit on the front seat with the driver. There, like the hen turkey who tried to sit on a hundred eggs, he can spread himself. The rider sat alongside the driver one morning, just at break of day, as the stage drove out of Blackberry. He was a through passenger to Squash Point. It was a very cold morning. In order to break the ice for a conversation, he praised the fine points of an off horse. The driver thawed. Yas, she's a good hoss, and I knows how to drive him. It was evidently a case of mixed breed. Where is Wood, who used to drive this stage? He's been laid up mit the rheumatir since yester week, and I thrives for him, so I went on reading a newspaper. A fellow passenger on a back seat, not having the fear of murdered English on his hands, coaxed the Dutch driver into a long conversation, much to the delight of a very pretty Jersey bluebell, who laughed so merrily that it was contagious. And in a few minutes, from being like unto a conventicle, we were all as wide awake as one of Christie's audiences. By sunrise we were in excellent spirits, up to all sorts of fun, and when a little later on our stage stopped at the first watering place, the driver found himself the center of a group of treaters to the distilled juice of apples. It is just as easy to say Applejack and be done with it, but the writer, being very anxious to form a style, cribs from all quarters. The so oft repeated expression, juice of the grape, has been for a long time on his hands, and wishing to work it up, he would have done it in this case, only he fears the skepticism of his readers. By courtesy they may wink at the poetical license of a reporter of a public dinner who calls turnip juice and painted whiskey juice of the grape, but they would not allow the existence for one minute of such application to the liquors of a Jersey tavern. It's out of place. Here's a package to leave at Mr. Scudder's, the third house on the left-hand side after you get into Jericho. What do you charge? asked a man who seemed to know the driver. Pout Aleffi, answered he, received the silver, he gathered up the reins, and put the square package in the stage box. Just as he started the horses, he leaned his head out of the stage, and, looking back to the man who gave him the package, shouted out the question, "'The third house on the left hand out of Yariko?' The man didn't hear him, but the driver was satisfied. On we went, at a pretty good rate, considering how heavy the roads were. Another tavern, more watering, more applejack, another long stretch of sand, and we were coming into Jericho. "'Any potty knows der Miss Kudur house?' asked the driver, bracing his feet on the mail-bag which lay in front of him, and screwing his head round so as to face in. There seemed to be a consultation going on inside the stage. "'I don't know nobody of that name in Jericho, do you, Lish?' asked a weather-beaten-looking man, who evidently went by water, of another one who apparently went the same way. "'There was old Square Gow's daughter. She marred a scudder, moved up here some two years back. Come to think, aunt, guess she lives nigh to Glass House,' answered Lish. The driver, finding he could get no light out of the passengers, seeing a tall raw-boned woman washing some clothes in front of a house, 
and who flew out of sight as the stage flew in, handed me the reins as he jumped from his seat and chased the fugitive, hallooing, I've got to smallpox, I've got to— Here his voice was lost, as he dashed into the open door of the house, but in a minute he reappeared, followed by a broom with an enraged woman annexed, and a loud voice shouting out, you get out of this clear yourself quicker i ain't going to have you diseasing honest folks if you have got the smallpox i tells you i've got the smallpox don't you wonderst it the smallpox this time he shouted it out in capital letters clear out i'll call the men folks if you don't clear and at once she shouted in a tip-top voice ike you ike where are you Ike made his appearance on the full run. W w what's the matter, mother? Miss Scudder, his mother? I should have been shocked, as I was on my first visit to New Jersey, if I had not had a key to this. That is a very pretty girl, I said on that occasion to a Jersey man. Who is she? She's old Miss Perrine's daughter, was the reply. I looked at the innocent victim of man's criminal conduct with commiseration. What a pity, I remarked. Not such a very great pity, said Jersey, eyeing me very severely. I reckon old man Perrine's got as big a cedar swamp as you or I either would like to own. Her grandfather you speak of? No, I don't. I'm talking about her father. He that married Abe Sims' daughter and got a power of land by it. And that gal, their daughter, one of these days will step right into them swamps. Oh, I replied, Mrs. Perrine's daughter, accenting the Mrs. Mrs. or Miss, it's all the same in Jersey, he answered. Knowing this, Ike's appeal was intelligible. To proceed with our story, the driver, very angry by this time, shouted, I tell you once more in the last time, I've got the smallpox, and Mr. Ellis, he gives me a leffy to give the smallpox to Miss Scudder, and if that vro is Miss Scudder, I promise to give her the smallpox. It was Miss Scudder, and I explained to her that it was a small box he had for her. The affair was soon settled as regarded its delivery, but not as regards the laughter and shouts of the occupants of the old stagecoach as we rolled away from Jericho. The driver joined in, although he had no earthly idea as to its cause, and added not a little to it by saying in a triumphant tone of voice, I was pound to give the old woman's the small pox. End of the Dutchman Who Had the Small Pox Section 21 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Smith. Walk by William DeVere. Up the dusty road from Denver town to where the mines their treasures hide, the road is long and many miles the Golden Stire and town divide. Along this road, one summer's day, there toiled a tired man, begrimed with dust, the weary way he cussed, as some folks can. The stranger hailed a passing team that slowly dragged its load along. His hail roused up the teamster old and checked his merry song. Say, uh, stranger! Wow, whoa, whoa up! Can I walk behind your load a spell in this road? Well, no, you can't walk, but get up on this seat and rod. Get up here! Nope, that ain't what I want, for it's in your dust. That's like a smudge. I want to trudge, for I deserve it. Well, Pods, I ain't no hog, and I don't own this road, afore nor hind. So just get right up in the dust and walk, if that's what you're kind. Gee up, clang, the driver said. The creaking wagon moved amain, while close behind the stranger trudged, and clouds of dust rose up again. The teamster heard the stranger talk, as if two trudged behind his van, yet looking around he could only spy a single lonely man. Yet heard the teamster words like these, come from the dust as from a cloud, for the weary traveler spoke his mind, 
his thoughts he uttered loud, and this the burden of his talk. Walk, now you blank, blank, walk. Not the way you went to Denver? Well, blank, blank, blankety, blank, just walk. Went up in the mines and made your stake, enough to take you back to the state where you was born? Where in the hell is your corn? Well, walk, you blank, blank, walk. Dust in your eyes, dust in your nose, dust in your throat, and thick on your clothes, can hardly talk? I know it, but walk, you blank, blank, walk. What'd you do with all your tin? Yes, blow every cent of it in? Got drunk, got sober, got drunk again? Well, walk, blank, blank, just walk. What did you do? What didn't you do? Why, when you were there, your gold dust flew. You thought it fine to keep open and wine. Now walk, you blank, blank, walk. Stop to drink? What? Blankety water? Why, there water with you weren't anywhere. Tis wine, extra dry. Oh, you flew high. Now walk, you blank, blank, walk. Choke sure this dust? Well, that ain't the worst. When you get back where the diggings are, no pick, no shovel, no pan. Well, you're a healthy man. Walk, just walk. The fools don't all go to Denver town nor do the all from the mines come down. Most of us have had in our day, in some sort of shape, some kind of way, painted the town with the old stuff, dipped in stocks or made some bluff, mixed wines old and new, got caught in wedlock by a shrew, stayed out all night, tight, rolled home in the morning light with crumpled tie and torn claw hammer, and woke up the next day with a cat's and jammer, and walked, Oh, blank, blank, how we walked. Now don't try to yank every bun. Don't try to have all the fun. Don't think that you know it all. Don't think real estate won't fall. Don't try to bluff on an ace. Don't get stuck on a pretty face. Don't believe every jay's talk. For if you do, you can bet you'll walk. End of Walk Recording by Robert Smith Section 22 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Ada Kerman. Mr. Dooley on Gold Seeking by Finley Peter Dunn. Well, sir, said Mr. Hennessy, that Alaska's great place. I thought twas nothing but an iceberg with a few seals roosting on it and one or two hundred Ohio politicians that can't be killed on account of the Treaty of Pars. But here they tell me tis fairly smothered in gould. A man stubs his toe on the ground and lifts the top off of a gould mine. You go to bed at night and wake up with gould filling in your teeth. Yes, said Mr. Dooley. Clancy's son was in here this morning and he says a friend of his went to sleep out in the open one night and when he got up his pants assayed four ounces of gold to the pound, and his whiskers panned out as much as thirty dollars net. If I was a young man and not tied down here, said Mr. Hennessy, I'd go there. I would so. I would not, said Mr. Dooley. When I was a young man in the old country, we heard the same story about all America. We used to set be the tur fire o' nights, kicking our bare legs on the floor and wishing we was in New York, where all you had to do was to hold your hat and the gould guineas would drop into it. And when I got to be a man, I come over here with a ham and a bag of oatmeal, as sure that I'd return in a year with money enough to drive me own car, as I was that me name was Martin Dooley, and that was a cinch. But faith, when I'd been here a week, I seen that there was nothing but mud under the pavement. I learned that be means of a pickaxe at tin shillings the day, and that, though there was plenty of gould, them that had it were froze to it, and I come west, still looking for mines. The only mine I struck at Pittsburgh was a hole for sewer pipe. I made it. Seven shillings the day. Smaller than New York, but the living was cheaper, with Mongahela rye at five a throw. Put your hand around the glass. I was still dreaming gould, and I went down to St. Louis. The nearest I come to a fortune there was finding a corther on the street as I leaned over the dashboard of a car to whack the off mule. When I got to Chicago, I looked around for the gould mine. There was engines here then, but there wasn't any mines I could see. There was mud to be shoveled, and drays to be drove, and beats to be walked. I chose the dray for I was never cut out for a copper, and I'd had me fill of excavating, and I drove the dray till I went into business. 
me experience with gould mining is it's always in the next county if i was to go to alaska they'd tell me of the finds in siberia so i think i'll stay here i'm a silver man anyhow and i'm content if i can see gold once a year with some prominent citizen smiles over his newspaper i'm thinking that every man has a gould mine under his own doorstep or in his neighbor's pocket at the farthest well anyhow said mr hennessy i'd like to kick up the sod and find a ton of gold under me foot what would you do if you found it demanded mr dooley i dunno said mr hennessy whose dreaming had not gone this far then recovering himself he exclaimed with great enthusiasm i'd throw up me job and and live like a prince i tell ye what ye'd do said mr dooley ye'd come back here and strut up and down the street with your thumbs in your armpits and ye'd drink too much and ride in street cars then ye'd buy foldin beds and peonies and start a real estate office ye'd be fooled a good deal and lose a lot of your money and then ye'd tighten up ye'd be in a cold fear night and day that ye'd lose your fortune ye'd wake up in the middle of the night dreamin that ye was back at the gas house with your money gone ye'd be president of a charitable society ye'd have to wear your shoes in the house and your wife would have ye around to receptions and dances ye'd move to michigan avenue and ye'd hire a coachman that'd laugh at ye your boys would be judes and ashamed of ye and ye'd support your daughter's husbands ye'd rack rent your tenants and lie about your taxes ye'd go back to ireland on a visit and put on airs with your cousin mike ye'd be a main close-fisted unscrupulous old curmudgeon and when ye'd die to take half your fortune for rake williams to put ye right i don't want ye ever to speak to me when ye get rich hennessy i won't said mr hennessy end of mr dooley on gold seeking by finley peter dunn recording by ada kerman marlboro new hampshire www.kermanenterprises.com Section 23 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Rick Cornwall. Love Sonnets of a Hoodlum by Wallace Irving. Sonnet Number 1. Say, will she treat me white or throw me down? Give me the glassy glare or welcome hand? Shovel me dirt or treat me on the grand. Knife me or make me think I own the town. Will she be on the level, do me brown? Or will she joke me lightly on the sand, leaving poor Willie froze to beat the band? <laughs> Limp as your grandmother's mother hubbard gown. I do not know, nor do I give a whoop. But this I know, if she is so inclined, she can come play with me on our back stoop. Even in office hours I do not mind. In fact, I know I'm nice and good and ready to get an option on her as my steady. Sonnet number 8 I sometimes think that I'm not so good, that there are foxier, warmer babes than I, that fate has given me the calm go-by, and my long suit is sawing mother's wood. Then would I duck from under, if I could, catch the hog special on the jump and fly to some goat island planned by destiny for dubs and has-beens and that solemn brood. But spite of bug wheels in my cocoa tree, the trade in lager beer is still a hummin'. A schooner can be purchased for a V, or even grafted if you're fierce at bumming. My finish then less clearly do I see, for lo, I have another think coming. Sonnet number nine. Last night I tumbled off the water cart. It was a peacheruno of a drunk. I put the cocktail market on the punk and tore up all the sidewalks from the start. The package that I carried was a tart that beat Vesuvius out for sizz and spunk, and when they put me in my little bunk, you couldn't tell my jag and me apart. Oh, would I were the ice man for a space, then might I cool this red-hot coconut, corral the jim-jam bugs that manly race around the eaves that from my forehead jut, or will a carpenter please come instead and build a picket fence around my head? Sonnet number 12 Life is a combination hard to buck, a proposition difficult to beat. Even though you get there zha, zha with both feet, in forty flickers it's the same hard luck, and you're up against it nip and tuck. Shanghai without a steady place to eat, guide by the very copper on your beat, who lays to jug we when you run amuck. Oh, life, you give yours truly quite a pain. On the T-square I do not like your style. 
for you are playing favorites again, and you've got me handicapped a mile. Avaunt, false life, with all your pride and pelf, go take a running jump and chase yourself. Sonnet 14 Oh, mommer, wasn't Mame a looty toot last night when at the Rainbow Social Club she did the bunny hug with every scrub from Hogan's Alley to the Dutchman's boot? While little Willie, like a plug-eared mute, papered the wall and helped absorb the grub, played nest egg with the benches like a dub when hot society was easy fruit. Am I a turnip? On a strict QT, why do my tribulies get so ossified? Why am I minus when it's up to me to brace my Paris pansy for a glide? Once more my hoodoo's thrown the game and scored a flock of zeros on my tally board. Sonnet 21 At noon today Murphy and Mame were tied. A gospel huckster did the referee, and all the drug clerks' union loped to see. The queen of Minnie Street become a bride, and that bad actor Murphy by her side, standing where yours despondent ought to be. I went to hang a smile in front of me, but weeps were in my glimmers when I tried. The pastor murmured, two and two make one, and slipped a sixteen K on Mamie's grab. And when the game was tied and all was done, the guests shied footwear at the bridal cab. And Murphy's little gilt roof brother Jim snickered. She's left her happy home for him. End of Love Sonnets of a Hoodlum by Wallace Irwin. Recorded by Rick Cornwall. Section 24 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Smith. How Ruby Played by George W. Bagby Judd Brownin, when visiting New York, goes to hear Rubenstein, and gives the following description of his playing. Well, sir, he had the blamedest, biggest, catty-corneredest piano you ever laid eyes on. Something like a distracted billiard table on three legs. The lid was hoisted, and mighty well it was. If it hadn't been, he'd a tore the entire inside clean out and shattered him to the four winds of heaven. Played well. You bet he did. But don't interrupt me. When he first sat down, he peered to care mighty little about playing, and wished he hadn't come. He tweedled a little, a little on the treble, and tootle-wootle some on the bass, just fooling and boxing the thing's jaws for being in his way. And I says to a man sitting next to me, says I, What sort of fool playing is that? And he says, Hush. But presently his hands commenced chasing one another up and down the keys, like a parcel of rats scampering through a garret very swift. Parts of it was sweet, though and reminded me of a sugar squirrel, turning the wheel of a candy cage. Now, I says to my neighbor, he's showing off. He thinks of doing it, but he ain't got no idea, no plan of nothing. And if he'd play me a tune of some sort or other, I'd... But my neighbor says, hush, very impatient. I was just about to get up and go home, being tired of that foolishness, when I heard a little bird waking up away off in the woods and call sleepy-like to his mate. And I looked up, and see that Reuben was beginning to take some interest in his busyness. And I sat down again. It was the peep of day. The lot came faint from the east, the breezes blowed gentle and fresh. Some more birds waked up in the orchard, and then some more in the trees near the house, and all began singing together. People began to stir, and the gal opened the shutters. Just then, the first beam of the sun fell upon the blossoms a little more, and it touched the roses on the bushes. And the next thing it was broad day. The sun fairly blazed. The birds sung like they'd split their little throats. All the leaves was moving, and flashing diamonds of dew. And the whole wide world was bright and happy as a king. Seemed to me like there was a good breakfast in every house in the land, and not a sick child or woman anywhere. It was a fine morning. 
and I says to my neighbor, that's music, that is. But he glared at me like he'd like to cut my throat. Presently the wind turned, and it began to thicken up, and a kind of gray mist came over things. I got low-spirited directly. Then a silver rain began to fall. I could see the drops touch the ground. Some flashed up like long pearl earrings, and the rest rolled away like round rubies. It was pretty, but melancholy. Then the pearls gathered themselves up into long strands and necklaces, and then they melted into thin silver streams, running between gold and gravels. And then the streams joined each other at the bottom of the hill, and made a brook that flowed silent, except that you could kind of see the music, especially when the bushes on the banks moved as the music went along down the valley. I could smell the flowers in the meadow, but the sun didn't shine, nor the birds sang. It was a foggy day, but not cold. The most curious thing was a little white angel boy, like you see in pictures, that run ahead of the music brook and led it on and on, away out of the world, where no man ever was. Certain I could see that boy just as plain as I see you. Then the moonlight came without any sunset, and shone on the graveyards, where some few ghosts lifted their hands and went over the wall, and between the black sharp-topped trees splendid marble houses rose up, with fine ladies in the lit-up windows, and the men that loved them but could never get an eye of them who played on guitars under the trees, and made me that miserable I could have cried, because I wanted to love somebody. I don't know who better than the men with the guitars did. Then the sun went down, it got dark, and the wind moaned and wept like a lost child for its dead mother. And I could have got up then and there and preached a sermon better than any I ever listened to. There was nothing in the world left to live for, not a blame thing. And yet I didn't want the music to stop one bit. It was happier to be miserable than to be happy without being miserable. I couldn't understand it. I hung my head and pulled out my handkerchief and blowed my nose loud to keep from crying. My eyes is weak anyway. I didn't want anybody to be a gaze at me a snivelling. And it's nobody's business what I do with my nose. It's mine. But some several glared at me mad as blazes. Then, all of a sudden, old Reuben changed his tune. He ripped out and he rared, he tipped and he teared, he pranced and he charged like the grand entry at a circus. Appeared to me that all the gas in the house was turned on at once, things got so bright. And I hilt up my head, ready to look any man in the face, and not afraid of nothing. It was a circus, and a brass band, and a big ball, all going on at the same time. He lit into them keys like a thousand of bricks. He gave em no rest day or night. He set every living joint in me a-goin', and not being able to stand it no longer, I jumped sprang onto my seat and just hollered, Go it, Rube! Every blame man, woman, and child in the house riz on me and shouted, Put him out, put him out! Put your great-grandmother's grizzly gray greenish cat into the middle of next month, says I. Catch me if you dare. I paid my money, and you just come and nigh me. With that, some several policemen run up, and I had to simmer down. But I would have fit any fool that laid hands on me, for I was bound to hear Ruby out or die. He had changed his tune again. He hopped at ladies and tiptoed fine from end to end of the keyboard. He played soft and low and solemn. I heard the church bells over the hills. The candles of heaven was lit one by one. I saw the stars rise. The great organ of eternity began to play from the world's end to the world's end, and all the angels went to prayers. Then the music changed to water, full of feeling that couldn't be thought, and began to drop, drip, drop, drip, drop, clear and sweet, like the tears of joy falling into a lake of glory. It was sweeter than that. It was as sweet as a sweetheart sweetened with white sugar mixed with powdered silver and seed diamonds. It was too sweet. I tell you, the audience cheered. 
Reuben, he, he kind of bowed like he wanted to say, Much obliged, but I'd rather you wouldn't interrupt me. He stopped a moment or two to catch breath. Then he got mad. He run his fingers through his hair. He shoved up his sleeve. He opened his tailcoats a little further. He drunk up his stool. He leaned over, and, sir, he just went for that old pioneer. He slapped her face, he boxed her jaws, he pulled her nose, he pinched her ears, and he scratched her cheeks until she fairly yelled. He knocked her down, and he stamped on her shameful. She bellowed like a bull, she bleated like a calf, she howled like a hound, she squealed like a pig, she shrieked like a rat, and then he wouldn't let her up. He ran a quarter stretch down the low grounds of the base, till he got clean into the bowels of the earth, and you heard thunder galloping after thunder through the hollows and caves of perdition. And then he fox chased his right hand with his left, till he got way out of the treble into the clouds, where the notes was finer than the pints of cambric needles, and you couldn't hear nothing but the shatters of him. And then he wouldn't let the old piano go. He forward too. He crossed over first gentlemen. He chasséed right and left, back to your places. He all hands around the ladies to the right, promenade all, in and out, here and there, back and forth, up and down, perpetual motion, double twisted and turned and tacked and tangled into forty-seven thousand double bow knots. By jinx, it was a mystery. And then he wouldn't let the old piano go. He fetched up his right wing. He fetched up his left wing. He fetched up his center. He fetched up his reserves. He fired by file, he fired by platoons, by company, by regiments, and by brigades. He opened his cannon. Siege guns down there, Napoleons here, twelve-pounders yonder, big guns, little guns, middle-sized guns, round shot, shells, shrapnels, grape, canister, mortar, mines, and magazines, every living battery and bomb a-going at the same time. The house trembled, the lights danced, the wall shook, the floor came up, the ceiling came down, the sky split, the ground rocked, Heavens and earth, creation, sweet potatoes, Moses, nine pences, glory, tenpenny nails, Samson in a simmon tree, Tom Thompson in a tumbler cart, Roodle, oodle, 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 Ruddle, uddle, 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 Rattle, addle, rattle, Reedy, 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 Perank, bang, lang, perank, per bang. With that bang, he lifted himself bottle into the air, and he came down with his knees, his ten fingers, his ten toes, his elbow, and his nose, striking every single solitary key on the piano at the same time. The thing busted, and went into 1,757,542 hemi-demi-semi-quivers, and I knowed no more. When I came to, I were underground about twenty foot, in a place they call Oyster Bay a treatin' a Yankee that I'd never laid eyes on before and never expect to again. Day was breakin' by the time I got to the St. Nicholas Hotel, and I pledge you my word I did not know my name. The man asked me the number of my room, and I told him, Hot music on the half-shelf or two. End of How Ruby Played Recording by Robert Smith Section 25 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Reese. Plagiarism by John B. Tabb. If Poe from Pike the raven stole, as his accusers say, then, to embody Adam's soul, God plagiarized the clay. End of Plagiarism Recording by Matthew Rees, Davenport, Iowa Section 26 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rick Cornwall. Go lightly, gal, the cakewalk by Anne Virginia Culpertson. Sweetest little honey in all this land, come along here and give me your hand. Go lightly, gal, go lightly. Corn all shucked and the barn full clear. Come along, come along, come along, my dear. Go lightly, gal, go lightly. 
Fiddles they callin' us high and fine. Time for their dancin', come and jine. Go lightly, gal, go lightly. My pooty little honey, but you is sweet. And it's clap your hands and shake your feet. Go lightly, gal, go lightly. It's cut your capers all down the line, then make your manners and tiptoe fine. Go lightly, gal, go lightly. Oh, it's whirl your partners round and round, till you has the feet clean off the ground. Go lightly, gal, go lightly. Oh, it's turn and twist all round the floor, fling out your feet behind before. Go lightly, gal, go lightly. Great land of Goshen, but you is spry. Can't none of the other girls spring so high. Go lightly, gal, go lightly. Oh, roll your eyes and wag your head and shake your bones till you're nigh most dead. Go lightly, gal, go lightly. Don't talk to me about getting your breath. Go and dance this out of fit. Cause my death. Go lightly, gal, go lightly. Mm hmm Don't dance all the er folks down. Skip her long, honey, just one more round. Go lightly, gal, go lightly. Fiddles done played till the springs all break. Come her long, honey, just one more shake. Go lightly, gal, go lightly. Now take my arm and parade all around, so they see where the sure enough dancers found. Go lightly, gal, go lightly. Then give me your hand and we quit this here. Come along, come along, come along, my dear. Go lightly, gal. Go lightly. End of Go Lightly, Gal. Recorded by Rick Cornwall. Section 27 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Rees. The Golfer's Rubaiyat by H. W. Boynton Wake, for the sun has driven in equal flight the stars before him from the tea of night, and hold them every one without a miss, swinging at ease his gold-shod shaft of light. Now the fresh year, reviving old desires, the thoughtful soul to solitude retires, pours on this club and that with anxious eye and dreams of rounds beyond the rounds of liars. Come, choose your ball, and in the fire of spring your red coat and your wooden putter fling. The club of time has but a little while to waggle, and the club is on the swing. Whether at Musselburg or Shinnecock, in motley hose or humbler motley sock, the cup of life is ebbing drop by drop, whether the cup be filled with scotch or bock. A bag of clubs, a silver town or two, a flask of scotch, a pipe of shag, and thou beside me caddying in the wilderness. Ah, wilderness were paradise enow. They say the female and the duffer strut on sacred greens where Morris used to putt, himself a natural hazard now, alas. That nice hand quiet now, that great eye shut. I sometimes think that never springs so green the turf, as where some good fellow has been, and every emerald stretch the fair green shows his kindly tread has known, his sure play seen. Myself, when young, did eagerly frequent Jamie and his, and heard great argument of grip and stance and swing, but evermore found at the exit but a dollar spent. With them the seed of wisdom did I sow, and with mine own hand sought to make it grow. And this was all the harvest that I reaped. You hold it this way, and you swing it. So. The swinging brassy strikes, and, having struck, moves on. Nor all your wit or future luck shall lure it back to cancel half a stroke. Nor from the card a single seven pluck. And that inverted ball they call the high, by which the duffer thinks to live or die. Lift not your hands to it for help, for it as impotently froths as you or I. Yon rising moon that leads us home again, how oft hereafter will she wax and wane? How oft hereafter rising wait for us at this same turning, and for one in vain? And when, like her, my golfer, I have been, 
and am no more above the pleasant green. And you in your mild journey pass the hole I made in one. Ah, pay my forfeit then. End of the Golfer's Rubaiyat Recording by Matthew Reese, Davenport, Iowa Section 28 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dennis Smith. Mr. Dooley on Reform Candidates. By Finley Peter Dunn. That friend of yours, Dugan, is an intelligent man, said Mr. Dooley. All he needs is an index and a few illustrations to make him a bicyclopedia of useless information. Well, said Mr. Hennessy, judiciously, he ain't no Socrates, and he ain't no answers to questions column, but he's a good man that goes to his duty, and as handy with a pick as some people are with a cocktail spoon. What's he been doing again ye? Nothing, said Mr. Dooley, but he was in here Tuesday. Did you vote, says I? I did, says he. "'Which one of the distinguished bunco-steerers got your invaluable suffrage?' says I. "'I didn't have none with me,' says he. "'But I voted for Charter H,' says he. "'I've been with him six elections,' says he. "'And he's a good man,' he says. "'Do you think you voted for the best?' says I. "'Why, man alive,' I says. "'Charter H was assassinated three years ago,' I says. "'Was he?' says Dugan. "'Ah, oh, well, he's lived that down by this time.' He was a good man, he says. You see, that's what them reform lads want up again. If I liked reformers, Hennessy, and wanted for to see them win out once in their lifetime, I'd buy them each a suit of chilled steel, arm them with repeating rifles, and take them east of State Street and south of Jackson Boulevard. At present, the opinion that prevails in the ranks of the glorious army of reform is that there ain't anything worth seeing in this large and commodious desert but the pest house in the bridewell. Me friend William J. O'Brien is no reformer, but William J. understands that there's a few hundreds of thousands of people living in a part of the town that looks like nothing but smoke from the roof of the Onion League Club, that have only two pleasures in life, to work and to vote, both of which they do at the uniform rate of one dollar and a half a day. That's why William J. O'Brien is now a senator and will be an alderman after next Thursday, and it's why other people are sending him flowers. This is the way a reform candidate is elected. The boys downtown has heard things that ain't going right somehow. Franchises is being handed out to none of them, and once in a while a member of the club coming home a little late and trying to reconcile a pair of round feet with an embroidered sidewalk meets a strong-armed boy that pushes in his face and takes away all his marbles. It begins to be talked that the time has come for good citizens for to brace up and do something, and they agree to nominate a candidate for alderman. Who'll be put up, says they. How's Clarence Doolittle, says one. He's laid up with a coupon thumb and can't run. And how about Arthur Doheny? I swore an oath when I came out of college that I'd never vote for a man who wore a maid tie. Well then, let's try Willie Boy. Good, says the committee. He's just the man for our money. And Willie Boy, after thinking it over, goes to his tailor and orders three dozen pairs of pants, and decides for to be the standard-bearer of the people. Musing over his fried oysters and asparagus and his champagne, he bets a polo pony again a box of golf balls he'll be elected unanimous, and all the good citizens make a vow for to set the alarm clock for half-past three on the afternoon of election day so's to be up in time to vote for the representative of pure government. Tis some time before they comprehend that there are other candidates in the field. But the other candidates know it. The strongest of them, his name is Flanagan, and he's a retail dealer in wines and liquors, and he lives over his establishment. Flanagan was nominated enthusiastically at a primary held in his barn, and before Willie Boy had picked out pants that would match the color of the Australian ballot, this here Flanagan had put a man on the day watch, told him to speak gently to any registered voter that wanted to sleep behind the stove, and was out that night visiting his friends. Who was it judged the cakewalk? Flanagan. Who was it carried the pall? Flanagan. Who was it stood up at the christening? Flanagan. 
whose cards did the grieving widow, the blushing bridegroom, or the happy father find in the hack? Flanagan's. You bet your life. You see, Flanagan wasn't out for the good of the community. Flanagan was out for Flanagan and the stuff. Well, election day come around, and all the eminent friends of good government had special wire strung into the club and waited for the returns. The first precinct showed twenty-eight votes for Willie Boy to fourteen for Flanagan. That's my precinct, says Willie. I wonder who voted them fourteen. Coachman, says Clarence Doolittle. There are thirty-five precincts in this ward, says the leader of the reform element. At this rate I'm sure of four hundred and forty majority. Gossin, he says. Put a keg of sherry wine on the ice, he says. Well, he says, at last the community is relieved from misrule, he says. Tomorrow I will start in arranging amendments to the tariff schedule and the arbitration treaty, he says. We must be up and doing, he says. Hold on there, says one of the comedy. There must be some mistake in this from the sixth precinct, he says. Where's the sixth precinct, says Clarence. Over by the dumps, says Willie. I told me footman to see to that. He lives at the corner of Desplaines and Blue Island Avenue on Goose Island, he says. What does it show? Flanagan, three hundred and eighty-five. Hanson, forty-eight. Schwartz, twenty. O'Malley, seventeen. Casey, ten. O'Day, eight. Larson, five. O'Rourke, three. Mulcahy, two. Schmidt, two. Maloney, two. Reardon, two. O'Malley, two. Willie Boy, one. Gentlemen, says Willie Boy, arising with a stern look in his eyes, the rascal has betrayed me. Waiter, take the sherry wine off the ice. There's no hope for sound financial legislation this year. I'm going home. And as he goes down the street, he hears a band play and sees a procession headed by a calcium light and in a carriage with his plug hat in his hand and his diamond making the calcium look like a piece of punk in a smokehouse, Miss Flanagan, paying his first visit this side of the tracks. End of section 28 Mr. Dooley on Reform Candidates By Finley Peter Dunn Read by Dennis Smith Section 29 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Evening Musical by May Isabel Fisk Scene A conventional but rather over-decorated drawing-room. Grand piano drawn conspicuously to center of floor. Rows of camp chairs. It is ten minutes before the hour of invitation. The hostess, a large woman, is costumed in yellow satin embroidered in spangles. Her diamonds are many and of large size. She is seated on the extreme edge of a chair, struggling with a pair of very long gloves. She looks flurried and anxious. Poor relative, invited as a great treat, sits opposite. Her expression is timid and apprehensive. They are the only occupants of the room. Hostess. No such thing, Maria. You look all right. Plain black is always very genteel. Nothing I like so well for evening myself. Just keep your face to the wall as much as you can, and the worn places will never show. You can take my ecru lace scarf if you wish, and that will cover most of the spots. I don't mean my new scarf, the one I got two years ago. It's a little torn, but it won't matter, for you. I think you will find it on the top shelf of the storeroom closet on the third floor. If you put a chair on one of the trunks, you can easily reach it. Just wait a minute till I get these gloves on. I want you to button them. I do hope I haven't forgotten anything. Baron von Gosheimer has promised to come. I have told everybody. It would be terrible if he should disappoint me. Masculine voice from above. Sarah, where the devil have you put my shirts? Everything is upside down in my room, and I can't find them. I pulled every blessed thing out of the chiffonier in the wardrobe, and they're not here. Hostess. Oh, Henry, you must hurry. I'm going to use your room for the gentleman's dressing room, and it's time now for people to come. You must hurry. Host from above, just as the front door opens, admitting Baron von Gosheimer and two women guests. Where the devil are my shirts? Hostess, unconscious of arrivals. Under the bed in my room. Hurry! Host, in bath-gown and slippers, dashes madly into wife's room and dives under bed as women guests enter. 
Unable to escape, he crawls farther beneath bed. His feet remain visible. Women guests discover them. Guests in chorus. Burglars! Burglars! Help! Help! Baron von Gossheimer, ascending to the next floor, hears them and hastens to the rescue. Baron. Don't be alarmed, ladies. Has either of you a poker? No. That is to be deplored. Catches host by heels and drags him out. Tableau. Hostess to poor relative, giving an extra tug at her gloves. There! It's all burst out on the side. That stupid sales lady said she knew they would be too small. Oh, dear, I'm that upset! And these Louis Kahn slippers are just murdering me. I wish it were all over. Enter Baron von Gossheimer and women guests. Hostess. Dear Baron, how good of you! I was just saying if you didn't come I should wish my musical in Jericho. And now that you are here, I don't care if anyone else comes or not. To women guests. How do you do? I must apologize for Mr. Smith. He's been detained downtown. He just telephoned me. He'll be in later. Do sit down. It's just as cheap as standing, I always say, and it does save your feet. You ladies can find seats over in the corner. Detaining Baron. Dear Baron. Enter guests. Guest. So glad you have a clear evening. Now, when we gave our affair, it poured. Of course, we had a crowd just the same. People always come to us, whether it rains or not. Takes a seat. Guests begin to arrive in numbers. Hostess. So sweet of you to come. Guest. So glad you have a pleasant evening. I am sure to have a bad night whenever I entertain. Hostess to another guest. So delightful of you to come. Guest. Such a perfect evening. I'm so glad. I said as we started out, now this time Mrs. Smith can't help but have plenty of people. Whenever I entertain, it's sure to... More guests. Telegram arrives, announcing that the prima donna has a sore throat and will be unable to come. Time passes. Male guest to another. Well, I wish to heaven something would be doing soon. This is the deadest affair I was ever up against. Omnipresent joker, greeting acquaintance. Hello, old man. Going to sing tonight? Acquaintance. Oh, yes, going to sing a solo. Joker. Solo, you can't hear it? Ha, 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 ha. Guests nearby groan. Voice overheard. Madam Cully, my dear, she always tells you that you haven't half enough of material and makes you get yards more. Besides, she never sends your pieces back, though I've... Fat old lady to neighbor. I never was so warm in my life. I can't imagine why people invite you just to make you uncomfortable. Now when I entertain, I have the windows open for hours before anyone comes. Joker aside. That's why she always has a frost. Ha 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 ha. Host enters, showing traces of hasty toilette. Face red and a razor cut on chin. Host rubbing his hands and endeavoring to appear at ease and facetious. Well, how do you do, everybody? Sorry to be late on such an auspicious... Joker interrupting. Suspicious! Ha 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 ha! Host. Occasion. I hope you're all enjoying yourselves. Chorus of guests. Oh, yes, indeed. Hostess. Shh, shh, shh. I have a great disappointment for you all. Here is a telegram from my best singer saying she is sick and can't come. Now we will have the pleasure of listening to Miss Jackson. Miss Jackson is a pupil of Madame Parcheesi of Paris. Singer whispers to her. Oh, I beg your pardon, it's Madame Marchese. Deaf old gentleman seated by piano, talking to pretty girl. I'd rather listen to you than hear this caterwauling. Old gentleman is dragged into corner and silenced. Young woman singing. Why do I sing? I know not, I know not. I cannot help but sing. Oh, why do I sing? Guests moan softly and demand of one another. Why does she sing? Woman guest to another. Isn't that just the way? Their relatives are always dying, and it's sure to be wash day or just when you expect company to dinner, and off they go to the funeral. Butler appears with tray full of punch glasses. Male guest to another. Thank the Lord. Here's relief in sight. Let's drown our troubles. The other. It's evident you haven't sampled the Smith's punch before. I tell you, it's a crime to spoil a thirst with this stuff. Well, here's how. Woman guest to neighbor. I never saw Mrs. Smith looking quite so hideous and atrociously vulgar before, did you? 
neighbor. Never! Why did we come? Voice overheard. The one in a white lace gown and all those diamonds? Another voice. Yes, well, you know, it was common talk that before he married her. Hostess. Shh, shh, shh. Signor Padrella has offered to play some of his own compositions, but I thought you would all rather hear something familiar by one of the real composers. Rubens or Chopin. Schopenhauer, I think. Pianist plunges wildly into something. Voice, during a lull in the music. First you brown an onion in the pan, then you chop the cabbage. Guest in the dressing-room, just arriving to another. Yes, we are awfully late, too, but I always say you can never be too late at one of the Smith's horrors. Thin young woman, in limp pink gown and string of huge pearls, who has come to recite. I'm awfully nervous, and I do believe I'm getting hoarse. Mama, you didn't forget the lemon juice and sugar. Drinks from bottle. Now, where are my bronchial trochies? Don't you think I could stand just a little more rouge? I think it's a shame I'm not going to have footlights. Remember, you are not to prompt me unless I look at you. You'll get me all mixed up if you do. They descend. Hostess to elocutionist. Why, I thought you were never coming. I wanted you to fill in while people were taking their seats. The guests always make so much noise, and the singers hate it. Now, what did you say you would require? An egg-beater and a turnip, wasn't it? Oh, no, that's for the young man who is going to do the tricks. Are you all ready? Elocutionist, in a trembling voice. Y yes Hostess. Shh, shh, shh. Elocutionist. Aux Italiennes. At Paris it was, at the opera there, and she looked like... Guess to another. Thirty cents, old chap, I tell you, there's nothing will knock you out quicker than... Hostess. Shh, shh, shh. Young woman finishes and retires amid subdued applause, reappears immediately and gives the maniac. Hostess. As I have been disappointed in my best talent for this evening, Mr. Briggs has kindly consented to do some of his parlor magic tricks. Mr. Briggs steps forward, a large, florid young man, wearing a made dress-tie, the buckle of which crawls up the back of his collar. Briggs. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I shall have to ask you all to move to the other side of the room. This is accomplished with muttered uncomplimentary remarks concerning the magician. Briggs to hostess. I must have the piano pushed to the further end. I must have plenty of space. All the men guests are pressed into service, and with much difficulty the piano is moved. Briggs. Now I want four large screens. Hostess, faintly. But I only have two. Briggs. Well, then get me a clothes horse and a couple of sheets. Poor relative. You know, Sarah, I used the last two when I made up my bed in the children's nursery yesterday. I can easily get— Hostess, hastily. No, Maria, don't trouble. To guests. Perhaps some of you gentlemen wouldn't mind lending us your overcoats to cover the clothes horse. Chorus, with great lack of enthusiasm. Of course, delighted. They go for coats. Hostess to poor relative. Maria, you get the clothes horse. I think it's in the laundry, or— Oh, I think it's in the cellar. Well, you look till you find it. To Briggs. I got as many of the things you asked for as I could remember. Will you read the list over? Briggs. Turn up an egg-beater? Hostess. Yes. Briggs. Egg, large clock, jar of goldfish, rabbit, and empty barrel. Hostess. I have the egg. Briggs, much annoyed. I particularly wanted the goldfish, the clock, and the barrel. Guests grow restless. Hostess, couldn't you do a trick while we are waiting, one with the egg-beater and turnip? Briggs, no, I don't know one. Hostess, couldn't you make one up? Briggs, icily, certainly not. Gloom descends over the company until the poor relative arrives, staggering under the clothes horse. Chorus of men guests, let me help you. Improvised screen is finally arranged. Briggs performs parlor magic for an hour. Guests fidget, yawn, and commence to drop away one by one. Guest to hostess. Really, we must tear ourselves away. Such a delightful evening, not a dull moment. And your punch, heavenly. Do ask us again. Good night. Hostess. Thank you so much. So good of you to come. Another guest. Yes, we must go. I've had a perfectly dear time. Hostess. 
"'So sorry you must go. So good of you to come. Good night.' In the dressing-room. "'Wasn't it awful? Such low people. Why did we ever come? Parvenu. Elocutionist. "'I was all right, wasn't I, Mama? You noticed they never clapped a bit until I'd walked the whole length of the room to my chair. It just showed how wrought up they were. You nearly mixed me up, though, prompting me in the wrong place. I—' Hostess throwing herself on sofa as door closes on last guest. Well, I'm completely done up. To poor relative. Maria, run up to my room and get my red worsted bed slippers. I can't stand these satin tortures a minute longer. Entertaining is an awful strain. It's so hard trying not to say the wrong thing at the right place. But then, it certainly went off beautifully. I could tell everyone had such a good time. End of an evening musical. Section thirty of the Wit and Humor of America, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Reese. Comin' Thu, by Anne Virginia Culbertson. Years a sinner comin' thu, crowd round brethren sisters too, sing wid all yo might and main, help de sinner out her pain, he's comin', comin' thu. He been seekin' dis long time, help him cast a foe behind, clap your hands and sing and shout, help him cast a devil out, let's wrestle him right thu. Tear aside de gate or sin, hear him kickin' ter get in. Put up prayers with might and main, that he doesn't kick in vain. Y'all can pray him through. Heart a bussin' for de right, devil holdin' to him tight. Hear him swish dat forked tail, see de sinner man turn pale. Come on, and help him through. Sinner hangin' bove de pit, by a hair strotch over hit. Devil hole one end. And shake, y'all can see de sinner quake. Quick, help this man come through. Seize de ropes now, heavy man. Help de gospel ship ter land. One long pull and one great shout. Hallelujah, we got him out. De sinner done come through. End of coming through. Recording by Matthew Reese, Davenport, Iowa. Section 31 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joyce Couch. Aunt Dinah's Kitchen by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Like a certain class of modern philosophers, Dinah perfectly scorned logic and reason in every shape and always took refuge in intuitive certainty and here she was perfectly impregnable no possible amount of talent or authority or explanation could ever make her believe that any other way was better than her own or that the course she had pursued in the smallest matter could be in the least modified this had been a conceited point with her old mistress marie's mother and miss marie as Dinah had always called her young mistress, even after her marriage, found it easier to submit than contend. And so Dinah had ruled supreme. This was the easier in that she was perfect mistress of that diplomatic art which unites the utmost subservience of manner with the utmost inflexibility as to measure. Dinah was the mistress of the whole art and mystery of excuse-making in all of its branches, Indeed, it was an axiom with her that the cook can do no wrong. And a cook in a southern kitchen finds abundance of head and shoulders on which to lay off every sin and frailty, so as to maintain her own immaculateness entire. If any part of the dinner was a failure, there were fifty indisputably good reasons for it, and it was the fault, undeniably, 
of fifty other people, whom Dinah berated with unsparing zeal. But it was very seldom that there was any failure in Dinah's last results, though her mode of doing everything was peculiarly meandering and circuitous, and without any sort of calculation as to time and place, though her kitchen generally looked as if it had been arranged by a hurricane blowing through it, and she had about as many places for each cooking utensil as there were days in the year, yet, if one could have patience to wait her own good time, up would come her dinner in perfect order, and in a style of preparation which an epicure could find no fault. It was now the season of incipient preparation for dinner. Dinah, who required large intervals of reflection and repose, and was studious of ease in all of her arrangements, was seated on the kitchen floor, smoking a short, stumpy pipe, to which she was much addicted, and which she always kindled up a sort of censer, whenever she felt the need of an inspiration in her arrangements. It was Dinah's mode of invoking the domestic muses. Seated around her were various members of that rising race with which a southern household abounds, engaged in shelling peas, peeling potatoes, picking pin feathers out of fowls, and other preparatory arrangements. Dinah every once in a while interrupting her meditations to give a poke or a rap on the head to some of the young operators with a pudding stick that lay by her side. In fact, Dinah rolled over the woolly heads of the younger members with a rod of iron and seemed to consider them born for no earthly purpose but to save her steps, as she phrased it. It was the spirit of the system under which she had grown up, and she carried it out to its full extent. Miss Ophelia, after passing on her reformatory tour through all the other parts of the establishment, now entered the kitchen. Dinah had heard from various sources what was going on, and resolved to stand on defensive and conservative ground, mentally determined to oppose and ignore every new measure without any actual and observable contest. The kitchen was a large brick-floor department, with a great old-fashioned fireplace stretching along one side of it, an arrangement which St. Clair had vainly tried to persuade Dinah to exchange for the convenience of a modern cook-stove. Not she! No pussy-eider conservative of any school was ever more inflexibly attached to time-honored inconveniences than Dinah. When St. Clair had first returned from the North, impressed with the system and order of his uncle's kitchen arrangements, he had largely provided his own with an array of cupboards, drawers, and various apparatus to induce systematic regulation, under the sanguine illusion that it would be of any possible assistance to Dinah in her arrangements. He might as well have provided them for a squirrel or a magpie. The more drawers and closets there were, the more hiding holes could Dinah make for the accommodation of old rags, hair combs, old shoes, ribbons, cast off artificial flowers, and other articles of her too, wherein her soul delighted. When Miss Ophelia entered the kitchen, Dinah did not rise, but smoked on in sublime tranquillity, regarding her movements obliquely out of the corner of her eye, but apparently intent only on the operations around her. Miss Ophelia commenced opening a set of drawers. "'What is this drawer for, Dinah?' she said. "'It's handy for most anything, missus,' said Dinah. So it appeared to be. From the variety it contained, Miss Ophelia pulled out first a fine damask tablecloth stained with blood, having evidently been used to envelop some raw meat. "'What's this, Dinah?' You don't wrap up meat in your mistress's best tablecloth. Oh, lor, missus, no. The towels was all missing, so I just did it. I laid it out to wash that there. That's why I put it there. Shirtless, said Miss Ophelia to herself, proceeding to tumble over the drawer, where she found a nutmeg grater and two or three nutmegs, a Methodist hymn book, a couple of soiled madras handkerchiefs, some yarn and knitting work, a paper of tobacco and a pipe, a few crackers, one or two gilded china saucers with some pomade in them, one or two thin old shoes, a piece of flannel carefully pinned up 
enclosing some small white onions, several damask table napkins, some coarse crash towels, some twine and darning needles, and several broken papers from which sun-dry sweet herbs were sifting into the drawer. "'Where do you keep your nutmeg, Dinah?' said Miss Ophelia, with the air of one who prayed for patience. "'Most anywhere, missus. There's some in that cracked teacup up there, and there's some over there in that are cupboard. "'Here are some in the grater,' said Miss Ophelia, holding them up. "'La, yes, I put them there this morning. I likes to keep my things handy,' said Dinah. "'You, Jake, what are you stopping for? You'll catch it. Be still thar,' she added, with a dive of her stick at the criminal. "'What's this?' said Miss Ophelia, holding up the saucer of pomade. "'Laws, it's my hair grease. I put it thar to have it handy.' "'Do you use your mistress's best saucers for that?' "'No, it was because I was driv, and in such a hurry. "'I was gwine change it this very day. "'Here are two damask table napkins.' "'Them table napkins I put thar to get em washed out some day. "'Don't you have some places here on purpose for things to be washed?' "'Well, Master St. Clair got dat her chest,' he said, for dat. But I likes to mix up biscuit and have my things on it some days, and then it ain't handy a liftin' up the lid. Why don't you mix your biscuits on the pastry table there? Law, missus, get salt so full of dishes and one thing and another, there ain't no room, no ways. But you should wash your dishes and clear them away. Wash my dishes, said Dinah in a high key as her wrath began to rise over her habitual respect of manner. "'What does ladies know about work, I want to know? When did Master ever get his dinner if I was to spend all my time washing and putting up dishes? Miss Marie never told me so, no how. Well, here are these onions.' "'No, yes,' said Dinah. "'That's where I put em now. I couldn't remember.' Them's particular onions I was savin' for just here very stew. I forgot they was in that old flannel. Miss Ophelia lifted out the sifting papers of the sweet herbs. I wish Mrs. Wouldn't touch dem are. I likes to keep my things where I knows where to get em, said Dinah, rather decidedly. But you don't want these holes in the papers. Then's handy for sifting on out, said Dinah. But you see, it spills all over the drawer. Laws, yes. If Missus will go a tumbling things all up so, it will. Missus has spilled lots of outer way, said Dinah, coming uneasily to the drawers. If Missus will only go upstairs till my clearing up time comes, I'll have everything put to right. But I can't do nothing when ladies is round a hindrin. You, Sam, don't you give dat baby dat dear sugar bowl. I'll crack it over if you don't mind. I am going through the kitchen and going to put everything in order once, Dinah, and then I'll expect you to keep it so. Lower now, Miss Ophelia. That ain't no way for ladies to do. I never did see ladies doing no such. My old missus nor Miss Marie never did and I don't see no kind of need on it. And Dinah stalked indignantly about, while Miss Ophelia piled in sordid dishes, emptied dozens of scattering bowls of sugar into one receptacle, sorted napkins, tablecloths, and towels for washing, washing, wiping, and arranging with her own hands, and with a speed and alacrity which perfectly amazed Dinah. Lord, now, if that are the way them northern ladies do, they ain't ladies no how she said to some of her satellites, when at a safe hearing distance. I has things as straight as anybody, when my clearing up time comes, and I don't want ladies round a hendren and getting my things all where I can't find em. To do Gina justice, she had, at irregular periods, paroxysms of reformation and arrangement, which she called clearing up times, when she would begin with great seal and turn every drawer and closet, wrong side outward, onto the floors or tables, 
and make the ordinary confusion sevenfold more confounded. Then she would light her pipe and leisurely go over her arrangements, looking things over and discoursing upon them, making all the young fry scour most vigorously on the ten things, and keeping up for several hours a most energetic state of confusion, which she would explain to the satisfaction of all inquirers by the remark that she was a clearin up. She couldn't have things a goin as they had been, and she's goin to make these ere young ones keep better or for Dinah herself, somehow, indulged the illusion that she herself was the soul of order, and it was only the young uns and everybody else in the house that were the cause of anything that fell short of perfection in this respect. When all the tins were scoured, and the tables scrubbed snowy white, and everything that could offend tucked out of sight in holes and corners, Dinah would dress herself up in a smart dress, clean apron, and a high brilliant madras turban, and tell all marauding young uns to keep out of the kitchen, for she was goin to have things kept nice. Indeed, these periodic seasons were often an inconvenience to the whole household, for Dinah would contract such an immoderate attachment to her scoured tin as to insist upon it that it shouldn't be used again for any possible purpose, at least until the ardor of the clearing up period abated. End of Aunt Dinah's Kitchen Section 32 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Bill Mosley The Strike at Hinman's by Robert J. Burdett Away back in the fifties, Hinman's was not only the best school in Peoria, but it was the greatest school in the world. I sincerely thought so then, and as I was a very lively part of it, I should know. Mr. Hinman was the faculty, and he was sufficiently numerous to demonstrate cube root with one hand and maintain discipline with the other. Dear old man, boys and girls with grandchildren love him today, and think of him among their blessings. He was superintendent of public instruction, board of education, school trustee, county superintendent, principal of the high school, and janitor. He had a pleasant smile, a genius for mathematics, and a West Point idea of obedience and discipline. He carried upon his person a grip that would make the imported malady which mocks that name in these degenerate days call itself slack in very terror at having assumed the wrong title we used to have general exercises on friday afternoon the most exciting feature of this weekly frivolity consisted of a free-for-all exercise in mental arithmetic mr hinman gave out lists of numbers beginning with easy ones and speaking slowly each succeeding list he dictated more rapidly and with ever-increasing complications of addition subtraction multiplication and division until at last he was giving them out faster than he could talk one by one the pupils dropped out of the race with despairing faces but always at the closing peremptory answer at least a dozen hands shot into the air and as many voices shouted the correct result we didn't have many books and the curriculum of an illinois school in those days was not academic but two things the children could do they could spell as well as the dictionary and they could handle figures some of the fellows fairly wallowed in them i didn't 
I simply drowned in the shallowest pond of numbers that ever spread itself on the page, as even unto this day I do the same. Well, one year the teacher introduced an innovation, compositions by the girls, and speaking pieces by the boys. It was easy enough for the girls who had only to read the beautiful thought that spring is the pleasantest season of the year. Now and then a new girl from the east, awfully precise, would begin her essay, Spring is the most pleasant season of the year, and her would we call down with derisive laughter, whereat she walked to her seat very stiffly, with a proud, dry-eyed look in her face, only to lay her head upon her desk when she reached it and weep silently until school closed. But the speaking pieces did not meet with favor from the boys, save one or two good boys who were in training by their parents for congressmen or presidents. The rest of us, who were just boys, with no desire ever to be anything else, endured the tyranny of compulsory oratory about a month, and then resolved to abolish the whole business by a general revolt. Big and little, we agreed to stand by each other, break up the new exercise, and get back to the old order of things, the hurdle races in mental arithmetic and the geographical chance which we could run and intone together. Was I a mutineer? Well, say, son, your pa was a constituent conspirator. He was in the color guard. You see, the first boy called on for a declamation was to announce the strike, and as my name stood very high, in the alphabetical roll of pupils. I had an excellent chance of leading the assaulting column, a distinction for which I was not at all ambitious, being a stripling of tender years, ruddy countenance, and sensitive feelings. However, I stiffened the sinews of my soul, girded on my armor, by slipping an atlas back under my jacket, and was ready for the fray, feeling a little terrified shiver of delight, as I thought that the first lick Mr. Hinman gave me would make him think he had broken my back. The hour for speaking pieces, an hour big with fate, arrived on time. A boy named Abby Abbott, was called up ahead of me, but he happened to be one of the presidential aspirants. He was mate on an Illinois River steamboat, sternwheeler at that, the last I knew of him. And, of course, he flunked and said his piece, a sadly prophetic selection. Quote, Mr. President, it is natural for man to indulge in the illusions of hope. End quote. We made such suggestive and threatening gestures at him, however, when Mr. Hinman wasn't looking, that he forgot half his piece, broke down, and cried. He also cried after school a little more bitterly, and with far better reason. Then, after an awful pause, in which the conspirators could hear the beating of each other's hearts, my name was called. I sat still at my desk and said, I ain't going to speak no peace. Mr. Hinman looked gently surprised and asked, Why not, Robert? I replied, because there ain't going to be any more speaking pieces. And the teacher's eyes grew round and big as he inquired, 
who says there will not? I said in slightly firmer tones as I realized that the moment had come for dragging the rest of the rebels into court. All of us, boys! But Mr. Hinman smiled and said quietly that he guessed there would be, quote, a little more speaking before the close of the session, end quote. Then, laying his hand on my shoulder, with most punctilious but chilling courtesy, he invited me to the rostrum. The rostrum was twenty-five feet distant, but I arrived there on schedule time and only touched my feet to the floor twice on my way. And then and there, under Mr. Hinman's judicious coaching, before the assembled school, with feelings, nay, emotions, which I now shudder to recall, I did my first song and dance. Many times before had I stepped off a solo cachuca to the staccato pleasing of a fragment of slate frame, upon which my tutor was a gifted performer, but never until that day did I accompany myself with words. Boylike, I had chosen for my piece a poem sweetly expressive of those peaceful virtues which I most heartily despised so that my performance at the inauguration of the strike as mr hinman conducted the overture ran something like this oh not for me whack is the rolling whack drum or the whack whack trumpets wild whack appeal <laughs> or the cry swish whack of <laughs> war when the whack foe is come ouch or the ow oh wow brightly whack flashing whack whack steel wahoo 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 words and symbols cannot convey to the most gifted imagination the gestures with which i illustrated the seven stanzas of this beautiful poem i had really selected it to please my mother whom i had invited to be present when i supposed i would deliver it but the fact that she attended a missionary meeting in the baptist church that afternoon made me a friend of missions forever suffice it to say then that my pantomime kept pace and time with mr hinman's system of punctuation until the last line was sobbed and whacked out i groped my bewildered way to my seat through a mist of tears and sat down gingerly and sideways inly wondering why an inscrutable providence had given to the rugged rhinoceros the hide which the eternal fitness of things had plainly prepared for the schoolboy but i quickly forgot my own sorrow and dried my tears with laughter in the enjoyment of the subsequent acts of the opera as the chorus developed the plot and action mr hinman who had been somewhat gentle with me dealt firmly with the larger boy who followed and there was a scene of revelry for the next twenty minutes the old man shook bill morrison until his teeth rattled so you couldn't hear him cry he hit mickey mccann the tough boy from the lower prairie 
and Mickey ran out and lay down in the snow to cool off. He hit Jake Bailey across the legs with a slight frame, and it hurt so that Jake couldn't howl. He just opened his mouth wide, held up his hands, gasped, and forgot his own name. He pushed Bill Haskell into a seat, and the bench broke. He ran across the room and reached out for Lem Harkins, and Lem had a fit before the old man touched him. He shook Dan Stevenson for two minutes, and when he let him go, Dan walked around his own desk five times before he could find it, and then he couldn't sit down without holding on. He whipped the two Knowltons with a skate strap in each hand at the same time, the Greenwood family, five boys and a big girl, he whipped all at once with a girl's skipping rope, and they raised such a united wail that the clock stopped. He took a twist in Bill Rodecker's front hair, and Bill slept with his eyes open for a week. He kept the atmosphere of that schoolroom full of dust and splinters and lint, weeping, wailing and gnashing of teeth until he reached the end of the alphabet and all hearts ached and wearied of the inhuman strife and wicked contention then he stood up before us a sickening tangle of slate frame strap ebony ferrule and skipping rope a smile on his kind old face and asked in clear, triumphant tones. Who says there isn't going to be any more speaking pieces? And every last boy in that school sprang to his feet, standing there as one human being with one great mouth. We shrieked with concerted anguish, Nobody don't! And your pa, my son, who led that strike, has been speaking pieces ever since. End of the Strike at Hinman's by Robert J. Burdett Recording by Bill Mosley, Frelsburg, Texas, USA Section 33 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley. A Nautical Ballad by Charles E. Carroll. A capital ship for an ocean trip was the walloping window blind. No gale that blew dismayed her crew or troubled the captain's mind. The man at the wheel was taught to feel contempt for the wildest blow, and it often appeared when the weather had cleared that he'd been in his bunk below. The boatswain's mate was very sedate, yet fond of amusement, too and he played hopscotch with the starboard watch while the captain tickled the crew. And the gunner we had was apparently mad, for he sat on the after rail and fired salutes with the captain's boots in the teeth of the booming gale. The captain sat in a commodore's hat and dined in a royal way on toasted pigs and pickles and figs and gummery bread each day, but the cook was Dutch and behaved as such, for the diet he gave the crew was a number of tons of hot cross buns prepared with sugar and glue. All nautical pride we laid aside and we cast the vessel ashore on the Gulliby Isles where the poo-poo smiles and the rumble tum bunders roar and we sat on the edge of a sandy ledge and shot at the whistling bee, and the cinnamon bats wore waterproof hats as they danced in the sounding sea. On rubgub bark 
from dawn to dark we fed till we all had grown uncommonly shrunk when a chinese junk came by from the torriby zone she was stubby and square but we didn't much care and we cheerily put to sea and we left the crew of the junk to chew the bark of the rub-gub tree end of a nautical ballad by charles e carroll recording by bill mosley frelsberg texas u s a section thirty four of the wit and humor of america volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by matthew reese natural perversities by james whitcomb riley I am not prone to moralize in scientific doubt on certain facts that nature tries to puzzle us about. For I am no philosopher of wise elucidation, but speak of things as they occur from simple observation. I notice little things. To wit, I never missed a train because I didn't run for it. I never knew it rain that my umbrella wasn't lent, or when in my possession the sun but wore to all intent a jocular expression. I never knew a creditor to dun me for a debt, but I was cramped or busted. Or I never knew one yet, when I had plenty in my purse, to make the least invasion. As I, accordingly perverse, have courted no occasion. Nor do I claim to comprehend what nature has in view, in giving us the very friend to trust we oughtn't to. But so it is, the trusty gun disastrously exploded, is always sure to be the one we didn't think was loaded. Our moaning is another's mirth, and what is worse by half, we say the funniest thing on earth and never raise a laugh. Mid friends that love us over well and sparkling jests and liquor, our hearts somehow are liable to melt in tears the quicker. We reach the wrong when most we seek the right. In like effect, we stay the strong and not the weak, do most when we neglect. Neglected genius, truth be said, as wild and quick as tinder. The more you seek to help ahead, the more you seem to hinder. I've known the least the greatest, too, and on the self-same plan the biggest fool I ever knew was quite a little man. We find we ought and then we won't. We prove a thing, then doubt it. Know everything, but when we don't know anything about it. End of Natural Perversities Recording by Matthew Reese, Davenport, Iowa Section 35 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recorded by Rick Cornwall Bud Wilkins at the Show by S. E. Kaiser. Since I've got used to city ways and don't scare at the cars, it makes me smile to set and think of years ago. My stars! How green I was and how green all them country people be. Sometimes it seems almost as if this hardly could be me. Well, I was going to tell you about Bud Wilkins. I declare he was the derndest, greenest chap that ever breathed the air. The biggest town on earth, he thought, was our old county seat, with its one two-story brick hotel and dusty business street. We'd fairs in fall, and now and then a dance or a huskin' bee, which was the most exciting things Bud Wilkin ever see. Until one winter Skigginsville was all turned upside down by a troop of real play actors a comin' into town. The courthouse, it was turned into a theater that night. And I don't suppose I'll live to see another such a sight. I guess that every person who was able fur to go just naturally cut loose for once and went to see the show. Me and Bud, we stood around there all day in the snow. But gosh, it paid us, for we got seats right in the second row. Well, the brass band played a tune or two, and then the play begun. 
and twasn't long for the villain had the hero on the run. Say, talk about your pretty girls with sweet confiding ways. I never see the equal yet in all my born days of that there brave young heroine so clinging and so mild, and just as innocent as if she'd been a little child. I most forgot to say that Bud stood six feet in his socks, as brave as any lion to, and stronger than an ox. But there never was a man, I'll bet, that had a softer heart, and he was always sure to take the weaker person's part. Bud, he fell in love right off with that there pretty girl, and I suppose the feller's brain was in a fearful whirl. For there he sat and gazed at her, and when she sighed, he sighed. And when she hid her face and sobbed, he actually cried. He clenched his fist and ground his teeth when the villain laid his plot, and said out loud he'd like to kill the rogue right there on the spot. And when the hero helped the girl, Bud up and yelled, Hooray! He clean forgot the whole blame thing was nothing but a play. At last the villain trapped the girl, that sweet confiding child. And when she cried for help, why, well, I'll admit that I was riled. The hero couldn't do a thing but roll and wreathe around, and tug and groan because they'd got the poor chap gagged and bound. The maiden cried, Unhand me now, or weak girl that I am. And then Bud Wilkins, he jumped up and gave his hat a slam, and quicker than I can tell it, he was up there raising Ned, a rescue in the maiden and a punch in the rogue's head. I can't somehow particularize concerning that there a row. The whole thing seems a sort of a blur, as I recall it now, but I can still remember that there was a fearful thud with the air chock full of arms and legs and the villain under Bud. I never see a chap so bruised and battered up before as that there villain was when he picked him up from the floor. The show? Oh, it was busted, and they put poor Bud in jail, and kept him there all night because I couldn't go his bail. Next morning, what do you think we heard? Most surprised in all my life. That sweet, confiding maiden was the cruel villain's wife. Bud wilted when he heard it, and he groaned, and then says he, Well, I'll be dumbed. Bill, that's the last play-acting show for me. End of Bud Wilkins at the Show Recorded by Rick Cornwall Section 36 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Rees. Ballad by Charles Godfrey Leland. Der noble Ritter Hugo von Schwillensaufenstein rode out mit Spear und Helmet, und he come to the banks of the Rhine. And up there rose a mere maid, what hadn't got nothings on. Und she say, Oh, Ritter Hugo, where you go mit yourself alone? And he says, I rides into Creenwood, mit helmet und mit spear, till I comes into the gasthouse, and there I drink some beer. And then out spoke the maiden, for it hadn't got nothings on. I don't think much of people sh that go mit themselves alone. You'd better come down in the Vosser, where there's heaps of things to see, and have a splendid dinner, and travel along mit me. There you sees the fish swimmin', and you catches them every one. So sang this Wasser maiden, what hadn't got nothings on. There is drunks all full mit money in ships that went down of old, and you helps yourself by dunder, to shimmer in crowns of gold. Shust look at these spoons and watches, shust see these diamond rings. Come down and fill your pockets, and I'll kiss you like everything's. What you want mit your schnapps und lager, come down into der Rhine. There is pottles der Kaiser Charlemagne. Once filled mit gold red wine. Dat fetched him, he stood all spellbound. She pulled his coat tails down. She drawed him under the fosser, the maidens mit nothings on. End of ballad. Recording by Matthew Rees, Davenport, Iowa. Section thirty seven. Of the Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley. The Hoosier and the Salt Pile by Danforth Marble. I'm sorry, said Dan as he knocked the ashes from his regalia, as he sat in a small crowd over a glass of sherry at Florence's, New York, one evening. I'm sorry that the stages are disappearing so rapidly. I never enjoyed traveling so well as in the slow coaches. I've made a good many passages over the Alleghanies and across Ohio, from Cleveland to Columbus and Cincinnati, all over the south, down east and up north, in stages, and I generally had a good time. When I passed over from Cleveland to Cincinnati the last time in a stage, I met a queer crowd. Such a core, such a time you never did see. I never was better amused in my life. We had a good team, spanking horses, fine coaches, and one of them drivers you read of. Well, there was nine insiders, and I don't believe there ever was a stage full of Christians ever started before, so chuck full of music. There was a beautiful young lady going to one of the Cincinnati academies. Next to her sat a Jew peddler. Cows. And a market wedging him was a dandy blackleg with jewelry and chains around his breast and neck enough to hang him there was myself and an old gentleman with large spectacles gold-headed cane and a jolly soldering iron looking nose by him was a circus rider whose breath was enough to breed yaller fever and could be felt just as easy as cotton velvet a cross old woman came next whose look would have given any reasonable man the double-breasted blues before breakfast long side of her was a rail backwoods preacher with the biggest and ugliest mouth ever got up since the flood he was flanked by the low comedian of the party an indiana hoosier wind down to orleans to get an army contract to supply the forces then in mexico with beef we rode along for some time nobody seemed inclined to open the old auntie sat bolt upright looking crab apples and persimmons at the hoosier and the preacher the young lady dropped the green curtain of her bonnet over her pretty face and leaned back in her seat to nod and dream over japonicas and jumbles pantalettes and poetry the old gentleman proprietor of the bardolph nose looked out at the corduroy and swashes the gambler fell off into a doze and the circus convoy followed suit leaving the preacher and me vis a vis saying nothing to nobody in the ante he stuck his mug out of the window and criticized the cattle we now and then passed i was wishing somebody would give the conversation a start when in the ante made a break this ain't no great stock country says he to the old gentleman with the cane no sir says the old gentleman there's very little grazing here and the range is pretty much wore out then there was nothing said again for some time by and by the hoosier opened again it's the damnedest place for simmon trees and turkey buzzards i ever did see the old gentleman with the cane didn't say nothing and the preacher gave a long groan the young lady smiled through her veil and the old lady snapped her eyes and looked sideways at the speaker don't make much beef here i reckon says the hoosier 
No, says the gentleman. Well, I don't see how in hell they all manage to get along in a country whar thar ain't no ranges and they don't make no beef. A man ain't considered worth a cuss in Indiana what hasn't got his brand on a hundred head. Yours is a great beef country, I believe, says the old gentleman. Well, sir, it ain't anything else. A man that's got sense enough to follow his own cowbell with us ain't in no danger of starving. I'm going down to Orleans to see if I can't get a contract out of Uncle Sam to feed the boys what's been licking them infernal Mexicans so bad. I suppose you've seed them cussed lies what's been in the papers about the Indiana boys at Boney Vista. I've read some accounts of the battle, says the old gentleman that didn't give a very flattering account of the conduct of some of our troops. With that, the Indiani man went into a full explanation of the affair, and getting warmed up as he went along, begun to cuss and swear like he'd been through a dozen campaigns himself. The old preacher listened to him with evident signs of displeasure, twisting and groaning till he couldn't stand it no longer my friend says he you must excuse me but your conversation would be a great deal more interesting to me and i'm sure would please the company much better if you wouldn't swear so terribly it's very wrong to swear and i hope you'll have respect for our feelings if you hain't no respect for your maker if the hoosier had been struck with thunder and lightning he couldn't have been more completely took aback he shut his mouth right in the middle of what he was saying and looked at the preacher while his face got as red as fire swearing says the old preacher is a terrible bad practice and there ain't no use in it no how the bible says swear not at all and i suppose you know the commandments about swearing the old lady sort of brightened up the preacher was her duck of a man and the old fellow with the nose and cane let off a few oomph uh oomphs but indiany kept shady he appeared to be cowed down i know says the preacher that a great many people swear without thinking and some people don't believe the bible and then he went on to preach a regular sermon again swearing and to quote scripture like he had the whole bible by heart in the course of his argument he undertook to prove the scriptures to be true and told us all about the miracles and prophecies and their fulfillment the old gentleman with the cane took a part in the conversation, and the Hoosier listened without ever opening his head. I've just heard of a gentleman, says the preacher, that's been to the Holy Land and went over the Bible country. It's astonishing to hear what wonderful things he has seen. He was at Sodom and Gomorrah and seen the place whar lot's wife fell ah says the old gentleman with the cane yes says the preacher he went to the very spot and what's the remarkablest thing of all he seen the pillar of salt what she was turned into is it possible said the old gentleman yes sir he's seen the salt standing thar to this day what says the hoosier real genuine good salt yes sir a pillar of salt just as it was when that wicked woman was punished for her disobedience all but the gambler who was snoozing in the corner of the coach looked at the preacher 
a hoosier with an expression of countenance that plainly told us that his mind was powerfully convicted of an important fact right out in the open air he asked yes standing right in the open field whar she fell well sir says indiany all i've got to say is if she had dropped in our parts the cattle would have licked her up afore sundown the preacher raised both his hands at such an irreverent remark and the old gentleman laughed himself into a fit of asthmatics what he didn't get over till we came to the next change of horses the hoosier had played the mischief with the gravity of the whole party even the old maid had to put her handkerchief to her face and the young lady's eyes were filled with tears for half an hour afterward the old preacher had another word to say on the subject but whenever we came to any place or met anybody on the road the circus man nursed the thing along by asking what was the price of salt end of the hoosier and the salt pile recording by bill mosley frelsburg texas u s a section thirty eight of the wit and humor of america volume two this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kenneth Sargent Gagan. Arrival Entertainment by Kate Field. I once heard a bright child declare that if circuses were prohibited in heaven, she did not wish to go there. She had been baptized and was under Christian influences, and, previous to this heterodoxy, had never given her good parents a moment's anxiety. Her naive utterance touched a responsive chord within my own breast, for well did I remember how gloriously the circus shone by the light of the other days. How the ringmaster, in her wrinkled dress coat, seemed the most enviable of mortals being on speaking terms with all the celestial creatures who jumped over flags and threw balloons, how the clown was the dearest, funniest of men, how the young athletes in tights and spangles were my ideals of masculinity, and how Bella rose with one foot upon her native heath, otherwise a well-padded saddle, and the other pointed in the direction of the sweet little cherubs that sit up aloft, was the most fascinating of her sex. I am persuaded that circuses filled an aching void in the universe. What children did before their invention, I shudder to think. For circuses are to childhood what butter is to bread, and what the world did before the birth of Burnham is almost equally frightful of problem. Some are born to shows, others attain shows, and yet again others have shows thrusted upon them. Barnum is a born showman. If ever a man fulfills his destiny, it is the discoverer of Tom Thumb. With the majority of men and women, life is a failure. Not until one leg dangles in the grave is the Arasian detail disclosed. The round people always find themselves sticking in the square holes, and vice versa. But with Barnum, we need not deplore. We can smile at his reverses, from even the phoenix has caused to blush in his presence. Though persuaded by tongues of fire, Barnum remains invincible when iron, stone, and mortar crumble about him. And while yet the smoke is telling volumes of destruction, the cheery voice of the showman exclaims, Here you are, gentlemen, admission fifty cents, children, half price. Apropos of Barnum, once in my life I gave myself up to the unmitigated joy, weary of lecturing, and singing the song, I wish I were a boy again. I went to see the elephant. To speak truly, I saw not one elephant, but half a dozen. 
I had a feast of roaring and a flow of circus. In fact, I indulged in the wildest dissipation. I visited Barnum Circus and sucked peppermint candy in a way most childlike and bland. The reason seems obscure, but circuses and peppermint candy are as inseparable as peanuts in the Bowery. Appreciating the solemn fact, Barnum provides bigger sticks adorned with bigger red stripes than ever Romans sucked in the balmy days of the Colosseum. In the dim distance, I mistook them for barber poles, but upon direct application, I recognize them for my long lost own. However, let me, like the Germans, begin with the creation. Here, ladies and gentlemen, is for sale Mr. Barnum's autobiography, full of interest and anecdote on one of the most charming productions ever issued from the press. Nine hundred pages, thirty two full page engravings, reduced from three fifty to a dollar fifty. Every purchaser enters free. How ordinary mortals can resist buying Barnum's autobiography for one dollar, such a bargain as never was, is incomprehensible. I believe they cannot. I believe they do their duty like men, as one man I resisted, because I belong to the press, and therefore am not mortal. Who ever heard of a journalist getting a bargain? With Spartan firmness, I turned a deaf ear to the persuasive music of the propagandists, and entered where hope is all before. I was not staggered by a welcome from all the presidents of the United States, Fritz Green Halleck, General Hooker, and Grace Brown. These personages are rather woody, and red about the face, as though flushed with victories of the platform or the table. But I recognize their fitness in a menagerie. What athlete has turned more somersaults than some of these representative men? What lion has roared more gently than a few of these sucking doves? Barnum's tack in appropriating, grouping curiosities, living and dead, is too well known to require comment, passing what Sam Weller would call a regular knockdown of intellect. I took my seat high in the air amid a dense throng of my fellow creatures, and realized how many people it takes to make up the world. What did I see? I saw double. I beheld not one ring, but two, in each of which the uncommon variety of man was disporting in an entertaining manner. I felt for these uncommon men. Think what immortal hate must arise from these dual performances. We all like to receive the reward of merit, but when two performances are going on simultaneously, how are the artists to know from whom it is attended? Applause is the sweet compensation for which we all strive privately or publicly, and to be cheated out of it or left in doubt as to its destination is a refined form of the Inquisition. Fancy the sensations of a man balancing plates on the little end of nothing, a feat to which he has consecrated his life, at thought of his neighbor's performance of impossible feats in the air. It would be more than human in both not to wish the other in Jericho, or some other equally remote quarter of the globe. I sympathized with them. I became bewildered in my endeavor to keep one eye on each. If human beings were constructed on the same principle as Janus, and had two faces, a fore and an aft circus would be convenient. But as nowadays double-faced people only wear two eyes in their heads, the Barnum conception muddles the intellect. I pray you, great and glorious showman, take pity on your artist and your audience. Don't drive the former mad and the latter distracted. Remember that insanity is on the increase and that accommodations in asylums are limited. Take warning before you undermine the reason of an entire continent. Beware, beware. I hear much and see much of the physical weakness of women. Michelet tells the sentimental world that woman is an exquisite invalid, with perennial headaches and nervous perpetuality on the neck. It is a mistake when I gaze upon German and French peasant women. I ask Michelet, which is right, he or nature? And since my introduction to Barnum's female gymnast, a good-looking, well-formed mother of a family, 
who walks about unflinchingly with men and boys on her shoulders, and carries a three-hundred-pound gun as easily as the ordinary woman carries a clothes basket, I have been persuaded that the coming woman, like Brother Jonathan, will lick all creation. In that good time, women will have her rights, because she will have her muscle. Then, if there are murders and playful beatings between husbands and wives, the wives will enjoy all the glory of the crime. <laughs> what an outlook! And what a sublime consolation to the present and feeble race of wives that are having their throats cut and their eyes carved out, merely because their biceps have not gone into training. Barnum's female gymnast is an example to her sex. What woman has done, woman may do again. Mothers, train up your daughters in the way they should fight, and when they are married, they will not depart this life. God is on the side of the stoutest muscle, as well as of the heaviest battalions. It is perfectly useless to talk about the equality of the sexes as long as a man can strangle his own mother-in-law. I was exceedingly thrilled by the appearance of two young gentlemen from the Cannibal Islands, who are beautifully embossed in green and red, and have compassion for them for their sacrifices they made in putting on blankets and civilizations. Is it right to deprive them of their daily bread? I mean, their daily baby? Think what self-restraint they must exercise while gazing upon the toothsome infants that congregate at the circus. That they do gaze and smack their overhanging lips, I know, because, after going through the cannibalistic dance, they sat behind me and howled in a subdued manner. The North American Indian, who occupied an adjoining seat, favored me with a translation of their charming conversation, by which I learned many important facts concerning man as an article of diet. It appears that babies, after all, do not make the daintiest morsels. Tender they are, of course, but, being immature, they have not the rich flavor of a youthful adult. This seems reasonable. Veal is tender, but... Can it be favorably compared with beef? The cases are parallel. The embossed young men considered babies excellent for entrees, but for roasts there is nothing like plump maidens in their teens. Men of twenty are not bad eating when older. They are invariably boiled. Commentating upon the audience, the critics did not consider it appetizing, and, strange that it may appear, I felt somewhat hurt by the remark, for who is not vain enough to wish to be good-looking enough to eat? Fancy being shipwrecked off the Fuji Islands and discarded by the cannibals as a tough subject, while your companions are literally killed with attention. Can you not imagine that, under some circumstances, a peculiar jealousy of the superior tenderness of your friends would be a thorn in the flesh? rendering existence a temporary burden? If we lived among people who adored squinting, should we not all take to it and cherish it as the apple of our eye? And if we fell among the anthropopagy, would not our love of appropriation make us long to be as succulent as young pigs? What glory to escape from the jaws of death if the jaws repudiate us, so long as memory holds a seat in this distracted brain? I shall entertain unpleasant feelings toward the embossed young gentlemen, who did not sigh to fasten their affections, otherwise their teeth, on me. It was worse than a crime. It was bad taste. Roaming among the wild animals, I made the acquaintance of a cassowary, in which I have been deeply interested in since childhood's sunny hours, for then it was oft I sang a touching hymn running thus, if I were a cassowary, far away in Timbuktu, I should eat a missionary, hat and boots and hymn book too. For that hour the cassowary occupied a large niche in my heart. The desire to gaze upon a bird, capable of digesting food to which even the ostrich never aspired, pursued me by day and tinctured my dreams by night. What you see for all your life will come upon suddenly, but when the whole family is at dinner, says Thoreau, I met the cassowary at dinner. He was dining alone, having left his family in Africa, and I must say that I never met with a greater disappointment. 
were it not for the touching imitations of the hymn, I should believe it impossible for him to eat a missionary. A quieter, more amiable bird never stood on two legs. A polite attendant stirred him up for me, and yet his temper and his feathers remained unruffled. Perhaps if our geographical position had changed to Timbuktu, and I had been a missionary with a hymn-book in hand, the cassowary might have realized my expectations. As it was, one more illusion vanished. In order to regain my spirits, I shook hands with the handsome giant in brass buttons. And speaking of giants leads me to the subject of all of nature, particularly the Circassian young lady, the dwarf, the living skeleton, the albinos, and the what is it. I have dropped more than one tear at the fate of these unfortunate beings, for what is more horribly solitary than to live in a strange crowd with no one to love, none to caress? Noah was a human. When he retired to the ark, he selected two of a kind from all the animal kingdom for the sake of sociability as well as for more practical purposes. Showmen should be equally considerate. To think of those albino sisters with never an albino bow, of the Circassian beauty with never a Circassian sweetheart, of the living skeleton with never another skeleton in his closet, how can he look so good-natured would be most mysterious, were not his digestion pronounced perfect. To think of that wretched what-is-it with never a Mrs. what-is-it produces unspeakable anguish, May they meet their affinities in another and a more sympathetic world, where monstrosities are impossible for the reason that we leave our bones on earth. Since gazing at the what is it, I have become a convert to Darwin. It is too true our ancestors stood on their hind legs, and the less we talk about pedigree the better. The noble Democrat in search of a coat of arms and a grandfather should visit a grand moral circus. Let us assume a virtue, though we have it not. Let our pride ape humility. When I asked which I thought the greater necessity of civilization, lectures or circuses, I should lay my right hand upon my left heart and exclaim, Circuses. End of Arrival Entertainment by Kate Field Recording by Kenneth Sargent Gagan Section 39 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Rick Cornwall. Jakob Strauss by Charles Folan Adams. I have one funny little boy, but gom shoots to my knee. The queerest chap. The greatest rogue, as ever you did see. He runs and jumps and smashes things in all parts of the house. But what of that? He was mine son, mine little Jakob Strauss. He gets der measles on der mumps, and everything that's out. He spills mine glass of lager beer, puts snuff into mine kraut. He fills mine pipe mit limber cheese, that was the roughest choice. I'd take that from no other boy but little Jakob Strauss. He takes der milk band for a drum and cuts mine cane in two to make their sticks to beat it mit. Mine gracious, that was drew. I think mine head was split apart. He kicks up such a touse. But never mind, der boys was few like that young Jakob Strauss. He asks me questions such as these, who paints my nose so red? Who was it cut that smooth place out from the hair upon mine head? And there the place was broom the lamp, when the gleam I douse. How can I all these things explain to that small Jakob Strauss? I sometimes think I shall go wild, Miss Schmutz, a grazy boy, and wish once more I could have rest and peaceful times enjoy. 
but then he was asleep in bed, so quiet as a mouse. I praise, dear Lord, take anything, but leave that Jakob Strauss. End of Jakob Strauss Recorded by Rick Cornwall Section 40 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joyce Couch. Sethi and Sally by John Luther Long. The place was the porch of the store. The time was about ten o'clock in the morning of a summer day. The people were the amiable loafers and old Baumgartner. The person he was discoursing about was his son, Zephaniah. I am not sure that that name was not the ripe fruit of his father's fancy, with perhaps the scriptural suggestion, which is likely to be present in the affairs of a Pennsylvania German, whether communicant or not, even if he live in Maryland. Yas, always last, especially at funerals and weddings, except his own. He's sure to be on time at his own funeral, right out in front, huh? But sometimes he misses his wedding. Why, I know the feller. Yous all knows him, begoshins. That didn't get there till another feller married her, bout a more'n a year afterward. Wasn't it more'n a year, boys? Yas, Bill Eisenkraut. Or, no, was it his brother, Balser Iron Cabbage? Seems to me now it was false. Some sing with a bee at the front end, anyhow. Henry Wasserman diffidently intimated that there was a curious but satisfactory element of safety in being last, a fashtnach, in their language, in fact. Those in front were the ones usually hurt in railroad accidents, Alexander Althoff remembered. Safe, cried the speaker. Of course, and for why, say for why. Old Baumgartner challenged defiantly. No one answered, and he let several impressive minutes intervene. You don't know, hang you, none of you knows. Well, well, because he ain't there when any sing occurs, always a little late. They agreed with him by a series of sage nods. But, fellers, the worst is about the courting. It's no way to always be late. Everybody else gets there first, and it's nothing for the fudge night, but weeping, wailing, and the gnashing of teeth. Aunt, maybe the other fellow gets considerable happiness and a good farm. There was complaint in the old man's voice, and they knew that he met his own son, Seffi. To add to their embarrassment, this same son was now appearing over Luchchit Hill, an opportune moment for a pleasing digression. For you must be told early, considering old Baumgartner's longing for certain lands, tenements, and hereditaments, using his own phrase, which were not his own, but which adjoined his. It had passed into a proverb of the visage. Indeed, though the property in question belonged to one Sarah Pressel, it was known colloquially as Baumgartner's yearn. And the reason of it was this. Between his own farm and the public road, and the railroad station when it came, lay the fairest metal land farmer's eye had ever rested upon. I am speaking again for the father of Seffi, and with his hyperbole. Save in one particular, it was like an enemy's beautiful territory, lying between one's less beautiful own and the open sea, keeping one a poor inlander whose crops must either pass across the land of his adversary and pay tithes to him, or go by long distances around him at the cost of greater ties to the soulless owners of the turnpikes, who aggravatingly fix a gate each way to make their ties more sure. So, I say, it was like having the territory of his enemy lying between him and the deep water, save, as I've also said, in one particular, to wit, that the owner, Sarah Pressel, that I've mentioned, was not old Baumgartner's enemy. In fact, they were tremendous friends, and it was by this friendship, and one other thing which I mean to mention later, that old Baumgartner hoped, before he died, to attain the wish of his life, and see, 
not only the Elysian pasture field, but the whole of the adjoining farm, with the line fences down, a part of his. The other thing I promised to mention, as an aid to this ambition, was Seffy. And since the said Sarah was nearly of the same age as Seffy, perhaps I need not explain further, except to say that the only obstruction the old man could see now to acquiring the title by marriage was Seffy himself. He was, and always had been, afraid of girls, especially aggressive, flirtatious, pretty, and tempestuous girls as this Sarah. These things, however, were hereditary with the girl. It was historical, in fact, that during the life of Sarah's good-looking father, so importunate had old Baumgartner been for the purchase of at least the meadow, he could not have ventured more than that at the time, and so obstinate had been the father of the present owner, he had red hair precisely as his daughter had, that they had come to blows about it, to the discomfiture of old Baumgartner, and afterwards they did not speak. Yet, when the loafers at the store laughed, Baumgartner swore that he would, nevertheless, have that pasture before he died. But then, as if fate too were against him, the railroad was built, and the station was placed so that the Pressel farm lay directly between it and him. And, of course, the life went more and more in the direction of the station, left him more and more out of it, and made him poorer and poorer, and Pressel richer and richer. And when the store laughed at that, Baumgartner swore that he would possess half the farm before he died, and as Pressel and his wife died, and Seppi grew up, and as he noticed the fondness of the little red-headed girl for his little tow-headed boy, he added to his adjuration that he would be harrowing that whole farm before he died, without paying a cent for it. But both Seppi and Sally had grown to a marriageable age, without anything happening. Seppi had become inordinately shy, why the coquettish Sally had accepted the attentions of Sam Pritz, the clerk of the store, as an antagonist more worthy of her, and in a fashion which sometimes made the father Seffy swear and lose his temper with Seffy. Though, of course, in the final disposition of the matter, he was sure that no girl so nice as Sally would marry such a person as Sam Pritz, with no extremely visible means of support. A salary of four dollars a week, and an odious reputation for liquor. And it was for these things, all of which were known, for Baumgartner had not a single secret, that the company at the store detected the personal equation in old Baumgartner's communications. Seffy had almost arrived by this time, and Sally was in the store, with Sam. The situation was highly dramatic, but the old man consummately ignored this complication and directed attention to his son. For him, the molasses tapper did not exist. The fact is, he was overjoyed. Suffy, for once on his life, would be on time. He would do the rest. Now, boys, just look at them. Dogged if they ain't both like one another. How's the proverb? Birds of a feather flock with one another? I don't know. Anyhow, Seth flocks with bits constant, and they understand one another good trotting like a sideways dog on a hot summer's day. And he showed the company, up and down the store porch, just how a sideways dog would be likely to trot on a hot summer's day, and then laugh joyously. If there had been an artist's eye to see, they would have been well worth its while, Seffy and the mare so affectionately disparaged. And, after all, I am not sure that the speaker himself had not an artist's eye, for a spring pasture or a fallow upland or a drove of goodly cows deep in his clover, I know he had. Perhaps you too have? And this was his best mare and his only son. The big bay, clad in broad-banded harness, soft with oil and glittering with brasses, was shambling indolently down the hill, resisting her own momentum, by the diagonal motion the old man had likened to a dog's sideways trot. The loop trace chains were jingling a merry dithy ramp, her head was nodding, her tail swaying, propped by his elbow on her broad back, one leg swung between the hames, the other one, keeping time on her ribs, was singing, I want to be an angel, and with the angels stand, a crown upon my forehead, a harp within my hand. 
I wonder what kind of angel he'd make anyhow. And beds, they'd have to go together. Say, I wonder if it is horse angels. No one knew. No one offered a suggestion. Well, it ought to be. Say, he can perform circus with old beds. They expressed their polite surprise at this for perhaps the hundredth time. Yes, they have a kind of circus ring in the backyard. He stands on one foot, then another, and on his hands with his feet kicking. And then he says words like hokey pokey. And Bets, she kicks up behind and throws him off in the dung, and we all laugh. Happy ever after. Bets, most of all. After the applause, he said, I guess I better wink him up. What you think? They one and all thought he had. They knew he would do it, no matter what they thought. His method, as usual, was his own. He stepped to the adjoining field, and selecting a clod with the steely polish of the plowshare upon it, threw it at the mare. It struck her on the flank. She gathered her feet under her in sudden alarm, then slowly relaxed, looked slyly for the old man, found him, and, understanding, suddenly wheeled and ambled off home, leaving Seffy prone on the ground as her part of the joke. The old man brought Seffy in triumph to the store porch. "'Just stopped you before you got to be an angel,' he was saying. "'We couldn't bear to think about you being an angel, "'and with the angel stand, a harp upon your forehead, "'a crown within your hand, I expect, when it's corn planting time.' Seffy grinned cheerfully, brushed off the dust, "'and contemplated his father's watch, held accusingly against him. "'Old Baumgartner went on gailing, "'About a half an inch past ten. Seffy, I'm glad you ain't breaking your reputation for being Vashnachich. Just about a quarter of an inch too late for the prize, with a flower on its hair and arms, and its frock pimmed up to show its new petticoat. Woo-hoo! If I had such a nice petticoat, he imitated the lady in question, to the delight of the gentle loafers. Seffy stared a little and rubbed some dust out of his eyes. He was pleasant, but dull. Yes, sir, Seff. If you'd got her an inch and a quarter past. Now Sam's got her, down in the cellar a lickin' molasses together. Doggone as Sam don't get everything, except his two bills. He don't want to be no angel till he dies. He's got fun enough here. But, Seffy, you're like the flow of molasses in January, at courting. This oblique suasion made no impression on Seffy. It was doubtful if he understood it at all. The loafers began to smile. One laughed. The old man checked him with a threat of personal harm. Hold on there, Jefferson Davis Busby, he chid. I don't allow no one to laugh at my sippy, except just me. I count I'm his daddy. That's a fight word the next time you do it. Mr. Busby straightened his countenance. He doesn't seem to notice nor care about girls, does he? No one spoke. No, darn him, he ain't no good. Say, what you give for him, huh? Here he goes to the highest bidder, for richer, for poorer, for better, or worser. Up and down, in and out, swing your partners, what's the bid? He can plow as crooked as a mule's hind leg, sleep hard as a possum in the winter time, eat like a snake, get left every time, but he can catch fish. They went on him. What's bid? No one would hazard a bid. Yet a minute, shouted the old fellow, pulling out his bullseye watch again. What's bid? Going, going, all done, going. A dollar. The bid came from behind him, and the voice was beautiful to hear. A gleam came into the old man's eyes as he heard it. He deliberately put the watch back in its pocket, put on his spectacles, and turned as if she were a stranger. Gone, he announced then. Who's the purchaser? Come forwards and take your property. What's the name, please? Many pretended to recognize her. Oh, Sally. Well, that's lucky. He goes in good hands. He's sound and kind, but needs the whip. He held out his hand for the dollar. It was the girl of whom he had spoken accurately as a prize. Her sleeves were turned up as far as they would go, revealing some soft lace-trimmed whiteness, and there was flour on her arms. Some patches of it on her face gave a petal-like effect to her otherwise aggressive color. The pretty dress was pinned far enough back to reveal the prettier petticoat, 
plus a pair of trimly clad ankles. Perhaps these are neither the garments nor the airs in which every farmer maiden did her baking. But then Sally was no ordinary farmer maiden. She was all this, it is true, but she was, besides, grace and color and charm itself. And if she chose to bake in such an attire, or even if she chose to pretend to do so, where was the churl to say her nay, even though the flower was part of a deliberate makeup? Certainly he was not at the store that summer morning. And Sephi was there. Her hair escaped redness by only a little, but that little was just the difference between ugliness and beauty. For whether Sally were beautiful or not, about which we might contend a bit, her hair was, and perhaps that is the reason why it is nearly always uncovered, or possibly, again, because it is so much uncovered was the reason it was beautiful. It seemed to catch some of the glory of the sun. Her face had a few freckles, and her mouth was a trifle too large, but in it were splendid teeth. In short, by the magic of brilliant color and natural grace, she narrowly escaped being extremely handsome, in the way of a sunburned peach or a maiden's blush apple. And even if you should think she were not handsome, you would admit that there was an indescribable rustic charm about her. She was like the aroma of the hayfields or the woods or a field of daisies or dandelions. The girl, laughing, surrendered the money, and the old man, taking an arm of each, marched them peremptorily away. Come to the house and get its clothes. Everything goes in. Stuff by pat, butterfly necktie, diamond pen, toothbrush, hair oil, razor, and soap. They had got far enough around the corner to be outside of the store during this gaiety, and the old man now shoved Seffy and the girl out in front of him, linked their arms, and retreated to the rear. What Sephaniah P. Baumgartner Sr. hath gin together? Let nobody put a thunder. Be goshens, he announced. The proceeding appeared to be painful to Seffy, but not to Sally. She frankly accepted the situation and promptly put into action its opportunities for coquetry. She begged him first, with consummate aplomb, to aid her in adjusting her parcels more securely, insisting upon carrying them herself, and it would be impossible to describe adequately her allures. The electrical touches, half caress, half defiance, the confidential whisperings, so that the wily old man in the rear might not hear, the surges up against him, the recoveries, only to surge again. These would require a mechanical contrivance, which reports not only speech but action, and even this might easily fail, so subtle was it all. Seth, Sephi, I thought it was his old watch he was auctioning off. I wanted it for, for a nest egg. <laughs> you must excuse me. You wouldn't have bet at all if you knowed it was me, I reckon, said Sephi. Yes, I would, declared the coquette. I'd rather have you than any nest egg in the whole world. Any two of them. And when he did not take his chance, if they were made of gold. But then she spoiled it. It's worse fellows than you, Sephi. The touch of coquetry was but too apparent. And better, said Sephi with a lump in his throat. I know I ain't no good with girls, and I don't care. Yes, she extended wickedly. There are better ones. Sam Pris. Sally looked away, smiled, and was silent. Sulky, Sethy, she finally said. If he does stink up salt mackerel and almost always drunk, Sethy went on bitterly, he's nothing but a molasses tapper. Sally began to drift farther away and to sing. Calling Pritz names was of no consequence, except it kept Sethy from making love to her while he was doing it, which seemed foolish to Sally. The old man came up and brought them together again. Och, go long and make love some more. I like to see it. I expect I'm an old fool, but I like to see it. It's like old times, yes. If you don't look out there, Seffy, I'll take a hand myself, yes, sir. Go long. He drew them very close, each looking the other way. Indeed, he held them there for a moment, roughly. Seffy stole a glance at Sally. He wanted to see how she was taking his father's odiously intimate suggestion. But it happened that Sally wanted to see how he was taking it. 
She laughed with the frankest of joy when their eyes met. Safi, I do like you, said the coquette, and you ought to know it, you imp. Now this was immensely stimulating to the bashful Safi. I like you, he said, ever since we were babies. Saf, I don't believe you, or you wouldn't waste your time so about Sam Pritz. Er, uh, Sally, where are you going tonight? Seffy met to prove himself, and Sally answered with a little fright at the sudden aggressiveness she had procured. Nowhere said I know of. Well, may I set up with you? The pea-green sunbonnet could not conceal the utter amazement and then the radiance which shot into Sally's face. Set up with me? Yes, said Sevy almost savagely. That's what I said. Oh, I, I guess so. Yes, of course, she answered variously and rushed off home. You know I own you, she laughed back, as if she had not been sufficiently explicit. I paid for you. Your pappy's got the money. I'll expect my property tonight. Yes, shouted the happy old man, and be goshens. It's a regular bargain. Ain't it, Seffy? You her property, real estate, her regiments and tenements. And even Seffy was drawn into the joyous, laughing conceit of it. Had he not just done the bravest thing of his small life? Yes, he cried after fascinating Sally, for sure and certain tonight. It's a bargain, cried she. For better or worser, richer or poorer, up and down and in and out, chasses, right and left. <laughs> oh, but Seffy. And the happy father turned to the happy son and hugged him. Don't you ever forget. She's a featherhead and got a bright red temper like her daddy. And they work mighty bad together sometimes. When you get her in the right place once, we'll nail her down hand and foot, so she can't get away. When she gets mad, her little brain evaporates, and if she had a knife, she'd go round stabbing her best friends. That's the only thing that saves her. Yes, and us, no knife. If she had a knife, it would be funerals following her all the time. They advanced together now, Seffy's father whistling some tune that had never been heard before on earth, and with his arm in that of his son, they watched Sally bounding away. Once more she leaped a fence, she looked laughingly back. The old man whistled wildly out of tune. Seffy waved a hand. Now you shout and Seffy, shout again. I didn't say a word. Well, it ain't too late. Go on. Now Seffy understood and laughed with his father. Nice gal, Seff Seffy. Yes, admitted Seffy with reserve. Healthy? Seffy agreed to this also. No, Dr. Bills, his father amplified. Seffy said nothing. Entire orphan. She's got a granny. Yes, chuckled old man at the way his son was drifting into the situation, thinking about granny. But Sally owns the farm. Ooh-hoo, said Seffy, whatever that might mean. And Sally's the boss. Silence. And Granny won't object to anybody Sally marries anyhow. She doesn't. She'd get licked. Who said anything about marrying? Seffy was speciously savage now, as any successful wooer might be. Nobody but me, thank you, said the old man with equally specious weakness. Look how she can jump a six-reel fence like a three-year-old filly. She's a nice gal, Seffy, and the farms joined together. Her pasture field and our cornfield. And she's kissing her hand backwards. But me or you, Seffy? Seffy said he didn't know, and he did not return the kiss, though he yearned to. Well, I bet a dollar that the first initial of his last name is Sephaniah P. Baumgartner, Jr. Well, said Seffy, with a great flourish, I'm going to set up with her tonight. Oh, get out, Seff though he knew it. You'll see. No, I won't, said his father. I wouldn't be so darn mean. No, sir. Seffy grinned at the subtle foolery, and his courage continued to grow. 
I am going to wear my high hat, he announced, with his nose quite in the air. No, Seth, said the old man with a wonderful inflection, facing him about that he might look into his determined face. For it must be explained that the stovepipe hat in that day in that country was dedicated only to the most momentous social occasions, and that, consequently, gentlemen wore it to go courting. Yes, declared Seffy again. Bring forth the stovepipe, the stovepipe, the stovepipe, chanted Seffy's frivolous father in the way of the anvil chorus. And my butterfly necktie with... With the diamond one? whispered his father. They laughed in confidence of their secret. Seffy, the successful wooer, was thawing out again. The diamond was not a diamond at all. The Hebrew who sold it to Seffy had confessed as much, but he also swore that if it were kept in perfect polish, no one but a diamond merchant could tell the difference. Therefore, there being no diamond merchant anywhere near, and the jewel being always immaculate, Seffy presented it as a diamond and had risen perceptibly in the opinion of the vicinage. And, and, Seth Seffy, what you going to do? Do? Seffy had been absorbed in what he was going to wear. Yas, yas, that's the most important. He encircled Seffy's waist and gently squeezed it. Oh, of course. Ha, but what yet? I regret that Seffy did not understand. Seffy, he said impressively, you have told me what you're going to wear. It ain't much. The weather's yet pretty cold nights. But I can stand it if you can. God knows about Sally. No, what you're going to do? That's the canotron I asked you. Still, it was not clear to Seffy. What, why, what I'm going to do, huh? Why, whatever occurs. Gosh almighty, I never say a word or do a thing to help the occurrences along. Goshens, what a setting up. Why, say, Seth, Seffy, what you set up for? Seffy did not exactly know. He had never hoped to practice the thing in that sublimely militant phase. What do you think? Why, Seth, plow straight to her heart. I wished I had your chance. I'd show ya other guess kind of setting up, ya, yes, sir. Make your mouth water and your head swim, becotions. Why, that Sally's like a young stubble field. Got to be worked constant and plowed deep and manured happy. And me be drained with blind ditches and crops changed constant and kept a going that away constant, constant, so the weeds can't get in her. Then you can put her in wheat after a while and get your money back. This drastic metaphor had its effect. Seffy began to understand. He said so. Now look here, Seffy, his father went on more softly. When you get to this, and this, and this, he went through his pantomime again, and it included a progressive caressing to the kissing point. Well, just when you boast comfortable, huh? Maybe on one cheer? What I know. It's been so long since I done it myself. When's you boast comfortable, ask her, just ask her, <clears throat> what she'll take for the pasture field. She owns you both, and she can't use both you and the pasture. A bird in the hand is worth suffering in another's feathers, not so. But Steffi only stopped and stared at his father. This again he did not understand. You know I've got no money to buy the pasture field, said he. Gosh almighty, said the man joyfully, making as if he would strike Seffy with his huge fist, a thing he did often. And ain't got nothing to trade? Nothing except the mare, said the boy. Say, ain't you got no feelings, you idiot? Oh, said Seffy, and then. But what's feelings got to do with cow pasture? Oh, no wonder he wants to be an angel, and wish the angel stand, holding things in his hands and on his head. He's too good for this vile world. He lingers shiffering on the brink, and fear to launch away into all his darn life, as someone didn't push him in. So here goes. This was spoken to the skies, apparently, and now he turned to his son again. Look a year, you dumber ox. Feelings is the same to gals like Sally 
as money is to you and me. You can buy potatoes with them. Do you understand? Sethi said that he did now. Well, then, I've tried to buy that pasture field a thousand times. Sethi started. Yes, that's a little bit of lie. Maybe a dozen times. And at last, Sally's daddy said he'd lick me if I ever said pasture field again. And I said it again, and he licked me. He was a big man, and, and red-headed yet, like Sally. No, look a year. You can get that pasture field without money. Except you damn feelings, which ain't no other use. Sally won't lick you. If she is bigger, don't be a scared. You got tons of feeling in you. You ain't got no other use for her. Don't waste them. They're good green money. And we'll get even with Sally's dad for licking me yet. And something on the side, huh? At last, it was evident that Seffy fully understood, and his father broke into that discordant whistle once more. A gal that can jump a six-rail fence, and without no running start, don't let her get a past you. Well, I'm going to set up with her tonight, said Seffy again with a huge ahem. And the tune his father whistled as he opened the door for him sounded something like, I want to be an angel. But not to buy pasture land, mourned Seffy. Oh, no, of course not, agreed his wily old father. That's just one of my darn jokes. I expect I'll take the fence down tomorrow. Say, Seth, you just marry the girl. I'll take care of the fence. It took Seffy a long time to ray himself as he had threatened. And when it was all done, you wouldn't have cared to know him. For his fine yellow hair was changed to an ugly brown by the patent hair oil with which he had dressed it and you would not have liked its fragrance, I trust. Bergamot, I think it was. His fine young throat was garroted within a starch standing collar. His feet were pinched in creaking boots, his hands close gauntleted in buckskin gloves, and he, altogether, incomparable, uncomfortable, and triumphant. Downstairs, his father paced the floor, watch in hand. From time to time he would call out the hour, like a watchman on a minaret. At last, look a year, Seffy. It's two inches a past seven. And by the time you get there, say never get another fella a chance to get there afore you or to leave after you. Seffy descended at that moment with his hat poised in his left hand. His father dropped his watch and picked it up. Both stood at gaze for a moment. Sonder, Seth. You're as beautiful as the sun, moon, and stars, and as kinky as several apothecary shops. Yeah, take the watch and get along, so you have some time with you. Now get along. You late already, cautions. You was behind the time when you was born. Yes, your mommy was disappointed in you right at first. You was seventy-six hours late. But now you reformed. Thank God. I always knowed it was a cure for it, but I didn't know it was anything as nice as Seffy. Seffy issued forth to his first conquest, lighted as far as the front gate by the fat lamp held in his father's hand. Oh, Seth, Seffy, shall I set up for you till you get home? He called into the dark. No, shouted Seffy. <laughs> that sounds right. Don't you forget, when you both were comfortable... <laughs> Maybe one share. <laughs> then we both take the fence down tomorrow. Maybe all three. End of Seffy and Sally. Section forty one of the Wit and Humor of America, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. An Archaeological Congress by Robert J. Burdett There's none can tell about my birth, for I'm as old as the big round earth. Ye young immortals clear the track, I'm the bearded joke on the carpet tack. Thus spoke a joke with boastful croak, and as he said upon his head he stood, and waited for the tread of thoughtless wight, who in the night gets up, arrayed in garments white, and indiscreet with unshod feet, prowls round for something good to eat. But other jokes, 
his speech provokes, and old and bald and lame and gray, with loftiest scorn they say him nay, and bid him hold his unweaned tongue, for they were blind ere he was young. So hot they grow, this complot crew, they laid a plan to catch a man that all the clan might then trepan his skull with jokes. They thus began. First mule, his heel at skill to try, amid his ribs like lightning laid, and back recoiled, he well knew why. Insurance man, he faintly said. Next, stove-pipe rushed as hot as fire. Put up, he cried, in accents bold. With elbow-joint he struck the lyre, and knocked the weather-prophet cold. But thou, ice-cream with grey so hair, three thousand years before the flood, cold, bitter cold, will be the day thou dost not warm the jester's blood. Spoons for the spoony was her ancient song, that with slow measure dragged its deathless length along. And longer had he sung, but with a frown, Old Pie, impatient, rose and roared, Behold, I am the funny clown, And without me there is no joke that goes. To every jester in the land I lend my omnipresent hand. I filled in jokes of every grade Since ever jokes and pies were made. Sewed, pegged and pasted, glued or cast, If not the first of jokes, I'll be the last. With heart unripe and mottled hide, Pale summer water melancholy sighed, And... But the muse would find it vain to give a list of all the train, the hairless, purblind, toothless crew that burst on man's astonished view, the bulldog in the garden gate, the girl's papa in wrathful state, mamma in law, the leathern clam, the woodshed cat, the rampant ram, the fly, the goat, the skating rink, the paste brush plunging in the ink, the baby wailing in the dark, the songs they sang upon the ark, things that were old when earth was new, and as they lived still old and older grew, and as these jokes about him cried, and all their ancient arts upon him tried, their hapless victim, man, lay down and died. End of an Archaeological Congress Section 42 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley. A Boy's View of It by Frank L. Stanton. Mother, she's always a sayin' she is. Boys must be looked after. Gotta be strict. When I tear my breeches, like Billy tears his, it helps him considerable when I am licked. But it ain't leaping over the fence or the post. It's just that same licking that tears him the most. Mother, she's always a saying to me, boys must have people to follow him round. Never can tell where they're going to be. Sure to get lost, and then have to be found. And then, when they find them, they're so full of joy they can't keep from loving and licking the boy. There's Jimmy Johnson. Got lost on the road. Daddy was driving to market one day, fell out the wagon, and nobody knowed, till they come to a halt, and his daddy said, Hey, wonder where Jimmy is gone to. But Jim, warn't no two hosses could keep up with him. Just kept a going, and got to a place where was a circus. Took up with the clown, cut off his ringlets, and painted his face. And then come right back to his daddy's own town. And what do you reckon? His folks didn't know and paid to see jimmy that night in the show and there's billy jenkins he just ran away folks at his house wasn't treatin him right went to the place where the red injuns stay and once when his daddy was travelin at night and the injuns took after him hollerin loud bill run to his rescue and scalped the whole crowd no use in talking. Boys don't have no show. Wasn't for people a follerin' em round. Just ain't no tellin' how fast they would grow. Bet you they'd fool everybody in town. But mother, 
she says they need lickin and so they're too busy hollerin to get up and grow end of a boy's view of it by frank l stanton recording by bill mosley frelsberg texas u s a Section 43 of The Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. Read by Dennis Smith. Ringworm Frank by James Whitcomb Riley. Just Frank reads his real name, though. Boys all calls him Ringworm Frank, cause he allus runs round so. No man can't tell where to bank, Frank'll be. Next you see or hear of him, drat his melts, that man's always somewheres else. We're old pards, but Frank he just can't stay still. Was prosperin' here, but lit out for further west. Somewheres on a ranch last year. Never heard nary a word how he liked it till today. Got this card, reads this away. Dad burn climate out here makes be homesick all winter long. And when springtime comes, it takes two pee wees to sing one song. One sings pee, and the other one wee. Stay right where you are, old pard. Wished I was this postal card. End of section 43 Ringworm Frank by James Whitcomb Riley Section 44 of The Wit and Humor of America Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kenna Sargent Gagan The Colonel's Clothes By Caroline Howard Gilman Every man has some peculiar taste or preference, and, I think, though Papa dressed with great elegance, he was a decided lover of his old clothes, and his garments, like his friends, became dear to him from their very wear and tear in his service and they were deposited successfully in his dressing-room though mamma thought them quite unfit for him he averred that he required his old hunting suits for accidents his summer jackets and vests though faded were the coolest in the world and his worm-eaten but warm racolure was admirable for riding about the fields in vain mamma represented the economy of cutting up some for the boys and giving others to the servants he would not have consented nor parted with articles in which he said he felt at home often did mamma remonstrate against the dressing-rooms look like a haberdashery shop often did she take down a coat hold it up to the light and show him perforations that would have honored new orleans or waterloo Often, while Chloe was flogging the pantaloons, which ungallantly kicked in return, did she declare that it was a sin and a shame for her master to have such things in the house. Still, the anti-cherubic shapes accumulated on the nails and hooks, and were even considered as of sufficient importance to be preserved from the fire at the burning of Roseland. Meanwhile, our little circle about this time was animated by a visitor from a peddler. As soon as he was perceived crossing the lawn with a large basket on his arm and a bundle slung across a stick on his shoulders, a stir of commencement in the house, Mamma assumed an air of importance and responsibility. I felt a pleasurable excitement. Chloe and Flora's eyes twinkled with expectations while from different quarters the house servants entered 
standing with eyes and mouth silently open, as the peddler, after depositing his basket and deliberatingly untied his bundle, offered his goods to our inspection. He was a stout man with a dark complexion pitted with the smallpox and spoke in a foreign accent. Huh, I confess that I yielded myself to the pleasure of purchasing some geegaws, which I afterward gave to Flora, while Mamma looked on at the glass and the plated ware. Uh, sheep, said the peddler, following her eye and taking up a pair of glass pitchers. Only two dollars sheep as dirt. If the lady hasn't any old clothes, it is better than money. Mamma took the pitcher in her hand with an inquisitorial air, balanced them, knocked them with her small knuckles. They rang as clear as a bell, then examined the glass, and there was not a flaw in it. Chloe went through the same process. They looked significantly at each other, nodded, set the pitcher on the slab, and gave a little appropriatory cough. They are certainly very cheap, said Mamma tentatively. It is for true, my mistress, said Chloe, with solemnity, and more handsomer than Mrs. Whitney's that she got for six dollars at Charleston. Chloe, said Mamma, were not those pantaloons you were shaking today quite shrunk and worn out? Yes, am she said, and they don't fit nohow. Well, last time the colonel wore those, he seemed quite unrestless. A step up, said her mistress, and bring them down. But what did you say was the price of these candlesticks, sir? Tish only von dollar. But tish more cheaper than the old close. If the lady will get the old close, I will put them into pillow and a fuss, and it is more cheaper, too. Chloe and Mamma looked at each other and raised their eyebrows. I will just step up and see those pantaloons, said Mamma in a consulting tone. It would be a mercy to the colonel to clear out some of that rubbish. I'm confident he can never wear the pantaloons again. They are rubbed in the knees and require seating, and he will never wear seated pantaloons. These things are unusually cheap, and the colonel told me lately we were in want of a few little matters of this sort. Thus saying, whispered to me to watch the peddler, she disappeared with Chloe. They soon returned, Chloe, bearing a variety of garments, for Mamma had taken the important premier pas. The pantaloons were first produced. Peddler took them in his hand, which, which flew up like an empty scale, to show how light they were. He held them up to the sun, and a half-contemptuous smile crossed his lips. Then, shaking his head, he threw them down beside his basket. A drab overcoat was next inspected, and was also thrown aside with a doubtful expression. Mr. Peddler, said Mamma, in a very soft tone, you must allow me a fair price. These are very excellent articles. Oh, they're fair, said he, but this closes is not very good. This closeman is not going to give me much for dish, and he laid a waistcoat on the other two articles. Mamma and Chloe had by this time reached the depths of the basket, and, with sympathetic exclamations, arranged several articles on the slab. "'You will let me have these pictures,' said Mamma, with a look of concentrated resolution, "'with a very nice pair of pantaloons.' The peddler gave a short whistle, expressive of contempt, shook his head and said, "'Tish not possible. I will give two fishes, and one von brush for the pantaloons and waistcoat. Mamma and Chloe glanced at each other and at me. I was absorbed in my own bargains, and said carelessly that the pictures were perfect beauties. Chloe pushed one picture a little forward. Mamma pushed the other picture on a parallel line, then poised a decanter, and again applied her delicate knuckles to the test. That, too, rang out of the musical and broken sound, so dear to the housewife's ear, and with a pair of plated candlesticks was deposited on the table. 
the peddler took up the drab overcoat. This clothesman's give me nothing but this. Mama looked disconcerted. The expression of her face implied the fear that the peddler would not even accept it as a gift. Chloe and she held a whispering consultation. At this moment, Bina came in with little Patsy, who, seeing the articles on the slab, pointed with her dimpled fingers and said her only words, Pretty, pretty. At the same moment, Lafayette and Venus, the two little novices in furniture rubbing exclaimed, Kai, if the dem things ain't shine too much. Well, these opinions made the turning point in Mama's mind, though coming from such an insignificant source. So, they are pretty, my darling, said Mama to Patsy, and then, turning to the peddler, she asked him what would he give in exchange for the pantaloons, the waistcoat and the coat? The peddler set aside two decanters, one pitcher, the plated candlesticks, and a hearth brush. "'Tis very good bargain to put a lady," said he. Mama gained courage. "'I cannot think of letting you have all these things without something more. You must at least throw in that little tray." And she looked at a small scarlet one, worth perhaps a quarter of a dollar. Peddler hesitated, and held it up so that the morning sun shone on its bright hues. "'I shall not make a bargain without that,' said Mama, resolutely. The peddler sighed, and, laying it with the other selected article, said, "'Tis very great bargains for the lady.' Mama smiled triumphantly, and the peddler, tying up his bundle, slinging his stick, departed with an air of humility. Meanwhile, Papa's voice was soon heard, as usual, before he was seen. Rub down beauty, Mark. Tell em Diggory to call out the hounds. There was a slight embarrassment in Mama's manner when he entered, mingled with the same quality of bravado. He nodded to her, tapped me on the head with his riding whip, gave Patsy a kiss as she stretched out her arms to him, tossed her in the air, and, returning her to her nurse, was passing on. Do stop, Colonel, said Mama, and admire my bargains. See this cut glass plate that we have been wishing for to save our best set? What's this trash? he said, pausing a moment at the table. Blown glass and a washed brass? Who has been fooling you? Colonel, said Mama. How can you? I cannot stop for a minute now, wife, said he. Jones and Ferguson are for a hunt today. They're waiting at Drake's Corner. It looks like falling weather, and my old drab will come in well today. Oh, Mama looked frightened, and he passed on upstairs. He was one of those gentlemen who keeps a house alive, as the phrase is, whether in merriment or on the contrary, and we were always prepared to search for his hat or his whip or his slippers, which he was confident you put in their places, but which by some miracle, were often in opposite directions. Our greatest trial, however, was with Mama's and his spectacles, for they had four pairs between them, far-sighted and near-sighted. They were indeed optical delusions, for when Papa wanted his, they were hidden behind some pickle jar, and when Mama had carefully placed hers in her key basket, they were generally found in one of Papa's various pockets. When a distant object was to be seen, he was sure to mount the near-sighted and cry, Whoosh! And if a splinter was to be taken out, nothing could be found but the far-sighted ones. And he said something worse. Sometimes all four pairs were missing, and such a scampering ensued. We now heard a great outcry upstairs. Wife! Chloe, Cornelia, come and find my drab coat. We looked at each other in dismay, but Papa was not a man for delay, and we obeyed his summons. Wife, said he, beating aside the externals of the man that hung about his dressing room, where is my old drab coat? Mama swallowed as if a dry artichoke was in her throat. And she said slowly, why, Colonel, you know you had not worn that coat for months, and as you have another one, and a racolure, the coat was full of moth holes. I exchanged it with the peddler for a cut glass and plate. 
"'Cut devils,' said Papa, who liked to soften an oath by combinations. "'It was worth twenty dollars, yes, more, because I felt at home in it. "'I hate to see new coats as I do.' "'But, Colonel,' interrupted Mama, "'you did not see the scarlet tray and the—' "'Scarlet nonsense,' shouted Papa. "'I believe if they could, women would sell their husbands to those rascally peddlers.' Beauty and the hounds were now pronounced ready. I followed Papa to the piazza and heard his wrath rolling off as he cantered away. End of section 44 The Colonel's Close by Caroline Howard Gilman Recording by Kenneth Sargent Gagan End of the Wit and Humor of America, Volume 2 Edited by Marshall Pickney Wilder